Good afternoon. My name is Councillor Francis Nunziata, and I'm the chair of, of this budget subcommittee. We have quorum, so I'd like to now call the meeting to order. Today's meeting is at Etobicoke Civic Center, and members of the public who are registered to speak are participating by video conference on WebEx and are also with us in the council chambers today, and welcome everyone. Today's meeting is stream, stream live being live on YouTube, and you can find the list of speakers for this session on toronto.ca slash council. I ask everyone for their patience if we experience any delays or technical problems with the video conference or web stream. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, um, including Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat's peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? No? Okay, thank you. This is a meeting of a subcommittee of budget committee and Councillor uh, Vincent Crisanti, Councillor Bravo and myself are members of one of the two subcommittees of the budget committee that have been established to hear public presentations today. Our colleagues on budget committee, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Moyes and Councillor Crawford are meeting to hear public speakers right now at the Scarborough Civic Centre on the east side of the city. This subcommittee will hear registered public speakers today at 1.30 and then again at our last meeting this evening at 6 p.m. The city clerk has posted the speakers list online at toronto.ca slash council. Click on the speakers button for today's meeting to see the complete list of names. For the public who are speaking today, here is how our speakers process works. We have speakers in person, in the room, and some online. If you're online, the video conference host will activate your microphone and you can turn on your video if you'd like. I will call each name on the list in order and then you'll have five minutes to speak to the budget committee. After that, please stay on the line because members of the committee may want to ask you questions. After your speaking time, you can stay connected and listen or follow the rest of the meeting on YouTube. The clerk has also received emails and communications from the public about the 2023 budget. Those communications are being ma made available to members on the CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. I encourage the public to send their comments to the budget committee throughout the budget process by, e by emailing buc at toronto.ca. This is the public's opportunity to speak about the budget. This is also our opportunity to consider their comments before we make our recommendations. Budget Committee will meet again on January 24th for a wrap-up meeting and to make recommendations to the Mayor and to City Council. Let's start with our first speaker. Our first speaker is Catherine Payne. Catherine, are, are you on the line? Catherine? Hi. Yes, I'm here. I'm just trying to make my video work. Can you folks see me? No, we can't see you, but we can. Oh, uh, yes, we, we can see you and hear you. No, I fixed my hair. Okay, so <laughs> Catherine, you have five minutes. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, hello, Budget Committee. I'm Catherine Payne. Uh, I want to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to address you and to talk about um, the city's budget. Um, so, uh, I've lived in Toronto since 1994. Um, my grandparents grew up here. Um, I'm a full, uh, I have a full-time job in the city of George Brown College, and I'm a homeowner in the East End. Um, I want to speak strongly against increasing the budget for policing here. Uh, I'm actually kind of shocked and distressed that Mayor Tory and the Toronto Police Services seem to be so tone deaf and out of touch with the life of most people in the city that they've even proposed this. Um, we do not need $50 million worth of new police. Um, I'm a bicyclist in this city. And when you travel Toronto on a bicycle, you're not as insulated from what's going on in the streets and in our neighborhoods as the way you can be in a car. 
when I'm biking around downtown Toronto, what I see these days is a stunning level of inequality. I see more and more expensive cars and more and more tents in churchyards, parks, and anywhere that my homeless neighbors can find shelter. I see the ways that 30 to 40 years of underfunding social services and supports has left so many in desperate situations and struggling to get by however they can. I experience firsthand the sad state of Toronto's street infrastructure. The roads are frankly terrible. Trash cans are falling apart everywhere. Parks and sewage systems are in need of maintenance, while developers seem to be building more and more and reaping more and more profits. I strongly support my neighbors of color in their concerns about and horrible experiences of racist policing. But I'm a middle class, uh, white, middle, middle aged lady. I'm fully employed and almost every encounter I've had with Toronto's police has been frustrating or unpleasant. I've had officers who came to my house to investigate my bike being stolen make racist jokes. When I've encountered police in other ways in the city, they have frequently been sexist, patronizing, and distinctly unhelpful. I'm not sure who it is who wants more police in this town or whose interests are actually being served by Toronto's police, but it sure as heck isn't my interests or those of any of the people close to me. I teach at George Brown College, as I mentioned, um, and so I also see a lot of what's going on for young people in this city and a lot of them are newcomers to this city. And I can tell you for sure that none of the challenges that my students are facing are going to be addressed by more policing. To support my students, this city needs to put funding into safe and genuinely affordable housing, into fixing the roads, creating more bike lanes and inexpensive transit options. We need to put money into mental health services desperately. We need to put money into recreation programs for young and older people. We need to put money into safe injection sites, into settlement services for new Canadians, into public libraries and public health initiatives, and into shelters and services for women and children who are escaping violence. I really have no problem paying higher property taxes, but not to hire more police to harass homeless people, harass youths of color, or invade the privacy of queer and trans folks in this town. If everything else weren't in tatters, perhaps we could consider enlarging the police force, but that's not the case right now. And there are many far more urgent needs in this town. Policing is not a solution to the problems facing Toronto or Torontonians. More police just means more violence, when what we need is more community supports, more parkland, more mental health services, resources for families, more and better, better transit, more rent and income supports, and to repair and rebuild as much of the municipal elements of our social safety net as we can. My message for Mayor Tory is that I think I want to think that you genuinely want to improve life in this city, but I cannot see how you can imagine that increasing policing does that. Please, committee and mayor, don't abuse your positions. Please listen to Torontonians. We don't want more cops. We want less policing. We want safe communities, but we know that police don't make our communities safer. Ten seconds. Mental health and public health services so and social programs that grow connection, yeah. compassion, and neighborliness, those make our communities safer. Thank Th you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, not you, but... uh, thank you for your... So thank you very much uh, for, for coming out, Catherine. And, and um, so I, I just wanted to ask you, have you read the uh, report from the Auditor General for the Toronto Police uh, Service? Uh, have you seen it? Have you heard about it? I have heard about it, sir, uh, but I have a full-time job. I haven't had time to do that much reading. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. So I, I just I want to point out that the report did raise very serious concerns about uh, 911 recommending that there be more staff available for deployment to respond to these calls um, and um, and also um, you know you you raise a good point in terms of this is uh, 
uh, not a problem that gets fixed by only one uh, one area uh, of whether it's just policing or investment in social services. But we do invest very heavily in social services and community supports. And uh, we've, I think, believe the number is well over half a billion dollars just for last year that we've invested. There's more money going into this particular budget as well. Uh, our police complement continues to decline. You're aware that we've lost 650 officers over the last few years? I wasn't aware of that, but that doesn't strike me as a massive loss, sir. I believe we need to invest a great deal more in mental health services in this city. What I see out on the streets is not people who are criminals. What I see is people who are distressed and disturbed. And the pandemic has made that worse. And there hasn't been an adequate response in mental health services or social supports to the fact that things are getting worse. Okay, but you're aware that we've lost 650 officers while at the same time the population of the city has grown to the tune of about half a million people, about the size of the city of London. And the city of London's got Sir, I don't. So, yeah. I don't think okay. we need uh, a heavy number of police per capita in this city. If we have adequate social supports and we grow healthy communities, we don't need police. Many of the things that police are okay. called to deal with in this city are problems that are caused by a lack of funding to social supports over the past 30 years. All right, thank you, uh, Catherine. Councillor Bravo. Thank you, Catherine, for your deputation. Um, I, under I understand that you are not unconcerned with community safety, is that correct? That is correct. And would you, um, would you support um, the expansion and the, con the accelerated investments into the uh, programs that the City of Toronto has effectively um, rolled out in the past uh, less than a year, including the Toronto Community Crisis Services, the Community Crisis Response, and a lot of investments in uh, violence prevention, uh, particularly among youth? Yes, I think those are excellent places to put $50 million. I'm afraid I don't think policing is an excellent place to put that money right now. Great. And we just had a report on the 16th um, evaluating those programs. So it looks like the evidence is pointing where you are. Thank you. Thank you. So are you aware that we're um, in the budget this year for community crisis service that we're investing $17 million? That's great. I'm very pleased okay. about that. So uh, I'm not sure that that will be enough. Well, right. So that's part of the budget. So um, what do you say about families uh, when we have a 12-year-old playing in a playground and there's a drive-by shooting and she's shot and killed? Uh, what do you say to these parents that feel they don't feel safe and these young youth that are out being killed? What do you say to those parents? I'm afraid I'm not sure I understand how that's relevant. Well, you're saying you don't want police, but there is a number of... Uh, of I'm not uh, saying I don't want police, madam. I'm saying that we have very uh, pressing priorities right now in Toronto that are not served by expanding the police force. Well, I think the or by giving more money I think the priority to a police force is, that already eats up an incredible percentage of my property taxes, ma'am. I think the, pr uh, the priority is to prevent young kids and drive-by shootings and have people killed. Uh, thank you. Madam Chair, a uh, point of personal privilege. I just want to know whether we're going to spend the entire time questioning the deputants. I, I spent um, about 12 hours yesterday at city at the city hall deputations and mind you this I'm a new councillor but I, I do think that these are regular residents who are coming to tell us what they feel and I don't think that need they need to be experts they don't need to have read the auditor general's report and they don't need to know um, the kind of information that we do can we just please treat them with respect and listen to what they have to say Councillor Bravo, when there's a deputant that's making a, a deputation, we have the right to ask them questions if they understand the process, the budget process, and what's being invested in this year's budget. Thank you very much. Our next uh, deputant is Marianne Kozinets. Marianne, are you on the line?
Marianne, thank you. You have five minutes. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marianne Kosnetz and I'm the training and engagement coordinator of the Toronto Drop-In Network. The Toronto Drop-In Network is an active member-based coalition of community organizations that run close to 50 diverse drop-in programs and ally programs like outreach across the city of Toronto. Our members work with people who are homeless, precariously housed, or socially isolated, including men, women, transgendered, and non-binary people, Indigenous people, youth, and seniors. I would like to focus on poverty reduction strategy budget enhancements, specifically the rollout of the Fair Pass program and TTC budget of proposed increase in fares. I have worked in a drop-in centre in downtown Toronto and now work to support the many diverse members of Toronto Drop-In Network. The TTC is a vital resource for everyone in the city. It provides people with the ability to be independent and to access the services that are needed on a daily basis. The steadily increasing cost of riding the TTC may not seem like much to those making the decisions, but given the incomes of those who make minimum wage are on OW, ODSP, or those without any income at all, the cost of fares is a huge barrier. People are forced to make a choice to pay for a ride or give up other essentials or walk or hitch a ride for free or likely just not to go out. Drop-ins in other community organizations are literally forced to provide TTC fares to individuals which they do not uh, receive any funding for. These funds come out of other monies that could be used towards the essential services that they are supposed to be providing. Essentially, they are people to the doctor's appointments or housing appointments. The City Fair Pass program is helping to address equity by providing lower fares and lower costs on monthly passes. The PRSO budget includes an additional $2 million for what the city is calling Phase 3A of the program. So we welcome the expansion of eligibility to low-income residents in deep poverty. However, the goal is to make sure the uptake is as high as possible. We are asking you to add funds required to do the comprehensive outreach to provide communication about the program and to encourage eligibility for people um, who apply. Also, there is a need to facilitate uptake by ensuring that it is easy and an inclusive application. Remember that not everyone has internet, computers, or the ability to access their income tax filings. So eligibility based on income as verified by income tax will mean that people must file income taxes. Therefore, the rollout of phase three should be supported with an increase in in-person application options and with more free community-based income tax clinics. So I quickly just want to walk you through some very simple math. A single person on OW makes $733 a month. A single person on ODSP makes $1,228 a month. The average bachelor apartment is $1,225. Um, the exponential cost of food and um, is really unlimited as we've all seen. So even with the fare pass of $2.10 a ride, you can see that people are still left in a deficit. The cost needs to be further reduced or eliminated altogether. Financial barriers to using the TTC equate to barriers to important aspects of people's lives, such as doctor's appointments, mental health wellness appointments, job interviews, housing appointments, just to name a few. Not everyone eligible applies for the use of the Fair Pass program. Some because they still can't afford the transit and require deeper subsidy, if not full subsidy. So please speed up the implementation and equity of including low income individuals and move towards a decrease in fares for those who cannot afford the TTC. As part of the poverty reduction strategy, people on OW and ODSP should have a free pass as $2.10, as I mentioned, is just not enough of a, of a discount. Um, it's still a lot of money for people who are likely not able to meet their own monthly budget and continue to get deeper into debt each month. Finally, I urge you not to support an increase in fares. People using the TTC have no options for travel. Studies have shown increase in fares lead to decreased ridership. Cutting services and increasing costs are not going to bring people back to the TTC. And I understand there's a lot of pressure for you to look at all the needs for what I still believe is a beautiful city. This is a pivotal time to champion the rights and needs of the many people who are struggling in Toronto. 
please take the opportunity to build more accessible, affordable, higher quality public transportation for this city. So the asks that we're asking for is number one, make the fair pass known and accessible to those people with low income. Supports to increase the uptake. Get started on planning for a deeper discount. We need to do more. Make the transit free. Number two is make the transit free during extreme weather alerts. Sometimes being able to get somewhere by TTC is life-saving. Not everyone who needs a token or a ticket is connected to an agency that distributes them during these alerts. I also stress the importance of making TTC accessible by eliminate, eliminating the requirement to pay for a fare during these times. Um, other helpful points, number three, raise the money TTC needs by using tools like commercial parking levy for the big malls and commercial landlords, which could unlock hundreds of millions of dollars. We heard from the last speaker, the huge disparity in, in the people who have and the people who have not. This would be a great way to assist um, people who, who have not. Um, and the last thing we're asking for is to provide funding to community drop-ins for TTC to allow them to assist those who are not able to access or afford the fair pass, but they still have the need to attend the appointments such as medical, mental health, employment, etc. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. There any? Okay, I also like to acknowledge uh, Mayor Tory, welcome, and also Councillor Holiday. Thank you for attending the meeting. Our next uh, deputant is Rosie Common. Rosie, are you on the line? No? Okay, thank you. Our next deputant is Drew Morio. Drew, are you on the line? Drew? Hello? Yes, can we can see and hear you. Thank you. You have five minutes. Okay. Great, thanks so much. Hello, members of the Budget Committee. I'm here because of Progress Toronto. My name is Dre and my pronouns are they, them. Prior to the pandemic, I was living in the West End in Ward 5. I was an Uber Eats delivery person walking 18 plus kilometers downtown a day just to cover the costs of rent. As the pandemic started and everything began to shut down with the increasing health precautions, I had to make the decision to either continue forward and push through the burnout I was already experiencing or to move back in with my parents outside the city. Unfortunately, a situation that too many young people are familiar with in Toronto. As a trans person, many in my community do not have the privilege of a place to return to. It is clear that we have a housing and homelessness crisis in the city of Toronto. It is clear that adding more enforcement to the streets of Toronto is not the true solution that will resolve the problems that we are facing as a city. For example, the proposed $3.3 million for private security to stop our unhoused neighbors from pitching tents in parks, 1.5 million towards security guards and libraries to remove folks who are trying to seek shelter, and the suggestions of raising TTC fares to add more special constables to remove people who use them to get through each cold and windy night in the city. This only pushes the problem away for a moment instead of solving it. This is not good enough. It is clear what needs to be done, creating access to affordable housing for working class citizens and our unhoused neighbors instead of putting an additional 48 million plus funds from Queens Park, which totals around 62.8 million into the police. Policing our unhoused neighbors is reported to cost the city of Toronto $100 million per year. With an estimate of 18,000 people experiencing homelessness day in and day out, how can you stand by and watch this happen? Let this happen. I say again, how can we stand by as a city as the housing and homelessness crisis continues to prevail through our daily lives? You have the power to make changes. You have the power to create access, safety, and support for the folks that need it most. We need to do better as a city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Our next deputant is Dega Nur. Yes, you can come forward. Oh, okay. You have five minutes. Thank you so much. I'll make it short. Um, uh, good afternoon. I want to say thank you. I wanted to do it in per, uh, virtual, but I thought coming in person um, will show that the importance of why I'm here today. Um, and this is exactly, um, sometimes we don't see the people that need these support and, and services. But uh, this is tailoring to the budget for Toronto Police, especially the hiring of 200 um, officers. Um, I am supporting our neighborhood community uh, officer program. Uh, that program, uh, many of, I know many people don't follow, uh, but I think this city uh, made a, a great decision when they, um, when they decided to do the community policing. And that is the future of policing. Uh, many other cities in the world adopted that and it was very successful. Um, this really supports the most marginalized communities who cannot uh, support or defend or fight when uh, issues do come to them. Um, having this program as a pilot here in 22, uh, I was invited to precipitate as a community um, a partner, stake stakeholder. Um, we we're very happy that the pilot was very successful because it did save life. It did created uh, engagement between uh, Toronto police and communities. Um, and I also believe that because these programs were put in place that it really also did help us during COVID because when people didn't know how to find support, they were able to call uh, or interact or um, with the neighborhood community officers that they built a relationship previous years. So putting prevention, building bridges, connecting communities um, is essential and uh, this program was expanded for many of you who follow. Um, and I am very happy that because it was so successful that it was also expanded to 34 um, um, uh, divisions in, in our city. Um, I know a lot of people are not educated in that. Please take the time, follow, uh, reach out to the neighborhood community officers. They are also, um, very, very engaged, very, uh, um, and these are not officers who you will see them ticketing you or stopping you to ask questions, but their job is to really reach out to communities that are hot spots in the city, um, really and building that bridge. And we need that. And I really very grateful uh, for, for the program. Uh, I know I still have a little bit of time where I went over, but I just want to say thank you. And I do support it, and my community supports it. And uh, we would like to see that uh, really uh, that community policing um, implemented and continue to be implemented in the city of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions, questions? Councillor Holliday? Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Nort. Thank you for coming. Um, you. What you had to say was a little different than many of the messages that we've heard uh, about those with strong opinions about investment in the police. I know my colleagues may not have had the fortunate experience to learn about the neighborhood community officers. Is there any uh, maybe short stories or examples you could share with the committee about the kinds of things that they do um, to better the community or to build trust, even a, a simple example that may be something a little bit different than what you may think of, of traditional policing. Yeah, so traditional policing is uh, something that we, I, I mean, learning, I, I have no background when it comes to <laughs> policing, not even my, answer, you know, f my family line. Uh, but what I learned is something that is new to me. So the tradition policing would be a police that is not engaging the people that they're serving, which is absolutely a failure. Uh, the neighborhood community program uh, provides 
the engagement directly with the individuals, communities, um, and especially communities that are most vulnerable, uh, whether homeless, uh, our seniors, youth, children, families who are most marginalized that cannot defend themselves when things do happen or when they have uh, uh, they need desperate support. Uh, I did not look for this program. This program came to me, and I couldn't uh, uh, push back. Uh, it was a reference that came from somebody that I do respect and have a great respect uh, because there was issues that happen and uh, certain communities are not, um, we, we had no interaction, no communication, no collaboration with the Toronto police due to historical events that happened in the past. I think we're part of the city um, and um, especially most you know racialized communities, and I think n not having that engagement, you're not serving us. But when you directly engage us, in a, in a way of understanding us, in a way of if we need help, and ask us what help we need instead of you coming and dictating, or or or, or, or turn a police coming to say this is what I think you need. So this was a, a different way. And, uh, and I think one of the things that I share is when um, the neighborhood community officer program uh, is, is, is a pro, you know, they come into the communities. Uh, they, you know, the last four years, you will see them come into community meetings. That is something that never took place in the past. You know, growing up, I've never seen an officer walk into my community. Well, most likely when I see an officer, I will run the other way. <laughs> so this was, um, you know, um, this is a different because they're here to, to, to stop and listen, to stop and ask if how they can be service. Because a lot of times, Toronto Police Services are so disconnected, uh, um, disattached from other services that City of Toronto provides. They're a service provider, just like Toronto Public Health, just like Toronto Firefighters, just like I would run to Toronto Firefighter than Toronto Police uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> so today is different, and that, that, is, that is what we need to bring service to Toronto Police. And one final question, it's a short one. Do you think the Neighborhood Officer Program has been successful here in building trust and really breaking the barrier of the perception of a police officer just being a uniform and being a person behind the uniform. So in other words, do, do people now know the neighborhood officers, if not by name, but at least by character and by face, they're familiar here and, and hence there's a little more trust. Yeah, they, they come to our, the community events, they uh, provide whether it's, uh, you know, helping with the uh, with events within the community, uh, piggyback riding on events that happen, um, having you know playing basketball with with children here in Toronto, uh, in in our community here, um, they have a movie night with the communities. You you don't see that in the past. I think um, we owe it to our residents to make sure that Toronto Police is a service, not uh, some sort of force. Uh, or or a watchman or something. No, you know, crime would be crime will always be there, but also uh, they need to provide that service, and that service uh, is something that we received through the neighborhood community officers. And these two hundred officers that they're gonna hire, I personally would like to see uh, diverse uh, communities, diverse individuals, uh, more uh, racialized um, officers be hired because that is going to actually expand uh, and have more equity uh, uh, in the program and, and more service. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? No. Uh, thank you very much for your deputation. So, um, so in, in your area, um, you have the neighborhood officers, so you're aware that uh, the budget, the police budget is increasing and expanding that, pro uh, that program. Um, so how many neighborhood officers do you have in, in your area? I think we have eight, and I know all of, all of eight of them because <laughs> they, they, 
And I'm very grateful that um, they do come in and, and, and make sure that they are very engaged, not just in my community where I live, but also the whole 22 division. Um, so we have eight of them, and hopefully we, we do have more. Yeah. And especially, um, I would like to see more women officers. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that would be nice. Thank you very much. Thanks. Excellent comments. Thank you very much. Our next uh, deputant is Kira Thompson. Here? Hi, can okay. everyone hear me? Yes, we can see and hear okay. you. You have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kira Thompson, and I am from the Christie Osmond Neighborhood Center. Uh, we are a nonprofit multi service organization. Uh, we have multiple locations uh, across Toronto with four uh, major separate locations. Uh, my location specifically is the Lower West Street location, which houses approximately uh, 30 unhoused men, and we've had to cut that back down to 15 uh, due to the pandemic. We serve over 300 individuals um, to access our daily drop-in and food access program. These are people outside of our program, not people within. Um, and currently, we are advocating for the budget to be moved into uh, more of the shelter system and more into the social support system. Now, our objective at the Christie Ossington Neighborhood Center is to improve the quality of life of our most vulnerable and community members, especially as we continue to see an aging population in our community. Last year, in order to meet this objective, our program served over 57,000 meals. We've continued to offer drop-in services like showers, computers, laundry, um, all of these to our community members. Over 800 community members have used these resources last year. That number is expected to grow. And our seniors on our Move Senior Social Club uh, currently has about 100 participants, um, which is to engage our senior community members in program activities uh, led by volunteers who are assisted by placement students in partnership with our public agencies, uh, such as Toronto Public Health. We also provide our participants with care packages, winter hampers, clothing, food, and fresh groceries. We are situated in the midst of an aging community and have seen the effects of the pandemic and inflation on everyone. Recently, our numbers have increased. And with our daily average community lunch service going from 132 from last year to 242 for this year, we're, ex we're expecting to see that number continue to grow over, well, over the next few months and continuing into next year. This effect is probably going to be um, exacerbated by the cold winter climate, but also even more so due to um, the increase in uh, in uh, the heat that we're going to be seeing during the summer now, as we've seen heat waves happen last year. So we have an increased need, but we also are seeing an increase in the cost of food, packages, toiletries, transport, as the proposed PTC raise and materials for our programs, our capacity is being decreased while our numbers are growing. The expenses have currently affected our funding for food, the quality of food we can offer, and the materials for our programs. Services, we, we need our services to be expanded, not to be cut. Nonprofit services providers need funding increases to allow them to pay their staff fair wages, consistent with the city's fair wage policy for contractors. Drop-in funding needs to be increased and the number of drop-ins funded needs to be expanded to allow for more in-person effective service provision and improved access to respite services. We have also seen a growing need for mental health support within our community. Uh, ignoring funding of basic health and wellness programs and meal programs will isolate our seniors and the unhoused and those experiencing discrimination, such as newcomers transitioning to a new city in the post-pandemic world. As a drop-in center, we don't only provide our community members with support towards their basic needs like housing and food. 
We are a safe space for them to socialize, form friendships, and learn from one another. We would like to close with a direct quote from our manager who's been, a, who's been with the program for over 20 years now. She has said, we are here to serve our community. Our community needs us more than we realize, especially post pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any questions? No, okay, thank you very much. Our next deputant is Brian McLean. Brian, you have five minutes. Hi, thank you. I'm a, a resident of Ward 2. I live um, near Kipling and the West Way. And uh, I cycled the 6.6 .6 kilometers to get here today. I, I saw uh, Councillor Nunziata as I arrived. Um, and I did the same on uh, Monday when we had a town hall that Councillor uh, Holiday and uh, Councillor Morley co-hosted. Um, so I just want to make a point that uh, people do cycle year-round um, in most of Toronto, except on snowy and icy days. Um, on the way here, uh, I encountered an accident on Martin Grove, a three-car accident. There were several fire trucks, ambulances, and police cars there. Um, and about a week ago on January 5th, there was a very violent accident near, near, my, uh, near where I live. Um, four car accident, at least one person was taken away in an ambulance. Uh, two of the cars were street racing. Um, so this tells me that, you know, our streets are designed in an unsafe way. And, uh, and these accidents uh, are, are violent, they, they scare people. Um, this accident happened at the corner of Martin Grove and the West Way with a, a, a hockey rink nearby. There were parents with children either walking from there or walking to the plaza. So it traumatizes everyone who witnesses this. Um, one of the, I think one of the uh, drivers fled the scene and another one was trying to flee the scene, uh, but somebody stood in front of his car as he was trying to back away and, and flee and he put himself at risk, <laughs> but the police uh, arrived and arrested the person. So anyway, I wanna, I wanna say that you know cars are a problem not only for safety, but as we know, for climate change, and that's a, a major concern of mine. I helped two years ago to found Etobicoke Climate Action, an all-volunteer group. And as you know, transportation contributes about a third of the greenhouse gas emissions. And we, we simply have to keep trying harder to figure out how to reduce car use, to, to provide alternatives, to make walking and cycling safer. Um, to redesign our communities so that they are something closer to this ideal of 50-minute communities, um, to increase uh, transit, increase the motivation to use transit, and unfortunately this 10 cent um, per, per ride increase seems to be affecting people who have the least income for the most part, people who can't afford to pay for the monthly pass. They don't have that, that, that money at the beginning of the month. Um, so that, that seems... Um, Kind of damaging to the most vulnerable part of the TTC customer base. So we want transit to become more and more attractive so that we use cars less. Um, and if, 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 if how, we, how we communicate that in a positive way that doesn't seem like it's taking away things from people but is providing actually a better community life because it's safer to walk to the store, to, to, to meet your neighbors on the way, I think um, in suburbia here, we're a little more isolated. We, we go to our home and you know, we drive to and fro and so forth, so we're not meeting our neighbors. So I, I just think um, that's one way to encourage uh, the climate action. I'm very happy to see that, um, that um, we're developing a carbon budget system that is supposed to be in place next year. Because I think that you know the dollar budget that you're wrestling with right now has to be parallel to a carbon budget. Wayne, what what are we spending on budget, on carbon rather, as well as what we're spending on on uh, in, you know in dollars and cents? So that's that's a really a good um, step forward. We're supposed to be uh, net zero by 2040. Um, we're supposed to have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 45 percent in just the next three years. And I don't see that we're making the progress that we need to be making. Um, about waste, uh, 
I volunteer in a number of ways now that I'm retired. I volunteer with the Toronto Nature Stewards in Raymore Park, which was the site, as you'll know, of uh, the devastating um, death toll during Hurricane Hazel when um, there was a neighborhood there that was wiped out. Um, so I volunteer there, and the first thing we do when we, when we practice stewardship is pick up litter. Um, and there's, of course, far too much litter. I'm glad that we're, we're instituting this reduction of single-use plastics. Um, that's, that's a good thing for, for, the, uh, for the community. Five seconds. Um, okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We do have a question good. for you. Councillor Holliday. Um, Ms. McLean, thank you. It's good to see you. Um, for the benefit of my colleagues and those listening, I, I wanted to pick up on a point that you talked about, and that was about walkable neighborhoods. So example, the accident, the, the crash, the crash, I guess, is the best way to describe it. It happened at West Way and Martin Grove. There's a strip plaza there. Yeah. Now, when I was, uh, when I was a kid, I you know, grew up close to where you live. Mm. We could walk down the street and we'd go to the drugstore, we'd go to the bank, we'd go to the supermarket, the variety store. I think it was even a hardware store. Mm. That plaza is now a townhouse development. And that was done all lawfully. And we're seeing more and more of that, right? Uh, properties that have large parking lots uh, and that have retail or often designated mixed use. And so people are developing those because you can put housing on there, you can turn a profit if you choose to sell it. But for the benefit of those listening, I mean, do we have a main street in Etobicoke Center? We don't. We have plazas. We have plazas. And there's few of them. And there's fewer of them. Um, and I won't put you on the spot, no. but, but would it be worth the city and city planning to look at jurisdictions that have gone through this to understand that to have walkable neighborhoods, you have to have walkable amenities? And there needs to be protections on these type of amenities. Or, or a, a uh, would you agree that it's a worthwhile endeavor to try to think about that? To think about if you're going to create housing and walkable communities, you have to have something to walk to. Uh, absolutely, um, I, I would be happy to work with with you in, in in planning an event with planning people. There's an amazing um, exhibit at the uh, Daniels School of, Ar of Architecture now about rethinking the suburbs. Right. And it's full of ideas. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I would urge you to try to, to to try to visit it. But yes, the, these like these single single story uh, plazas are kind of an underuse of that space. I'm glad that some malls and plazas are are building up, adding adding housing, but retaining the uh, the, the services, hope. the shops and services. I know that there's displacement when that happens, but. You still need those services. They they have to be retained, and and whether whether planning obligates that to happen, or does it slip away during these redevelopments? But yeah, we we um, we, we we want more housing in in the city to accommodate the crisis that we all have, and we we want to prevent sprawl because that's another environmental damage. Would, would you agree? Therein is the magic, right? When you rebuild, yeah. you don't want to replace it with uh, cell phone hair shops and nail salons, you want to have that complete set, including grocery stores and those types of things. Yes. It would be worth, I know we're straying a bit out of budget, but it does relate to the climate action plan that if we're going to be encouraging that, we've got to have those particular things. Yeah, I'd love to know if there are legal tools to obligate that happening, to obligate like fresh food in, in every plaza and that sort of thing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any further questions? No, okay. Our next deputant is Ingrid Boudet. Ingrid, are you on the line? There you are, Ingrid. Hello? Yes. Um, I have a presentation. May I be able to share my screen? Excellent. Okay, you have five minutes. Okay. okay, just trying to share. I cannot, I'm getting a uh, note. I cannot share my content unless the host, co host, or presenter makes you the presenter. I am now the presenter. There we are. Share. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
So going along the uh, lines of the previous uh, times, I'm going to talk about investing in active transportation and fighting climate change. So my name is Ingrid Boudet, and I've lived in Ward 4 for over 10 years. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today about the budget. I'm lucky enough to have choices in how I move around the city, but I prefer a bike. I always get a seat and I run on time. And I feel great knowing that I'm doing my part to help Toronto meet its transformed PO goals. This has not come without challenges. A crash with the driver of a car resulted in a third degree separation of my shoulder, which required two surgeries to insert and remove a piece of metal, and I haven't been the same since. More people are like me, trying to do their part, but they don't feel safe on our streets. For good reason. Our streets are not safe for anyone outside of a vehicle. These are the city's recommendations, three out of 10 key actions that the city promotes to help reduce climate change. And the allocation of funds that you are spending on transportation reflect, reflected in the graph below doesn't support these actions enough. Toronto bike share is a success story. It's one way that people can get around who can't afford to drive or don't want to. You can see the increase in ridership doubling since 2019. They're projecting to have over 1,000 stations, 10,000 bikes in all 25 wards. They should be able to build on a connected cycling network. And this is how we can help Toronto meet its climate goals. And transportation is an equity issue. This map shows how bike share is evaluating the equity gaps that exist. The red coloring indicates the priority areas, primarily Toronto's outer suburbs, or inner suburbs, however you choose to call it. Unless the streets are made safer, people will continue to be killed and injured, as per Brian's experience on the, on the way into the uh, on the way into the deputation. Vision Zero funding should be increased to $75 million annually. And Scarborough and Etobicoke streets are not safe. This graph shows the annual chance of people who walk and cycle being killed or seriously injured by wards. This data was taken from the TPS KSI killed or seriously injured data from the City of Toronto Open Data Portal. The most dangerous areas are where bike share wants to expand to. People in these areas deserve protected bike lanes, not paint, concrete. This creates a safer and more enjoyable <clears throat> excuse me, environment for everyone, including drivers. So the city must reallocate road space and accelerate the pace of installing bike lanes. The city is already behind in their, their mandate. And I'm asking the city to put the money where, where put your money where your mouth is. The card here serves those who can drive and does not serve anyone else. It creates the number one and number two environment ha environmental hazards to our health, air and noise pollution. It is not sustainable. And so eventually it's going to come down sooner or later. So why not start reducing demand on that infrastructure now? Improve transit choices for people, possibly toll the highway, and as other people have recommended, implement a commercial parking lot. In conclusion, I do not see how the mayor and city council can say they're addressing equity and climate change in this budget. Many people want to do their part, they're like me, and this budget does not support them or the city climate change. This is an inflection point. We're all at a very interesting point in, in, in our history. And will this budget help us build back better and reduce climate change? In my opinion, it will not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, so are you aware, Ingrid, that uh, Toronto Parking Authority is expanding their um, bike share throughout the city? Yes, I am. Yeah, great. Okay, and that's, and also we're also um, including the budget is cycling, dedicated bike lanes. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. I yeah. have seen bike share expand. I've seen bike share expand over time, but often those bike share stations are not on protected cycle tracks. So that is that is a problem. And so those cycle tracks should come along with the bike share. Many of them, many kilometers of cycle tracks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next deputant, next deputant is Christina Markham. Christina, you have five minutes. <laughs> Off to a great start there. Um, good afternoon. 
Thank you so much for your time and for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Christina Markham, and I'm here because of Progress Toronto. I've been a resident of Toronto for over 35 years, and I'm here today to share my concern over the $48 million increase to our police budget. I share this council's city, excuse me, I share this council's vision for a safer and more livable city, but I do not share that vision of how we get there. I would like to begin by acknowledging some of my privilege and the fact that it can sometimes make this city easier for me to navigate, especially in my interactions with the Toronto Police. I am a middle class white woman. I am a homeowner. Thanks to my family, my job, and my network, I have many safety nets available to me should I ever need them. And on the few occasions where I have had to reach out to the Toronto Police, I was treated with respect and I was grateful for their help. Unfortunately, I know that my experiences here are not universal. I live in downtown Toronto, and each and every day, I do see opportunities to make this city safer. I see neighbors who are experiencing mental health problems who don't have access to the care they need. I see neighbors who are being evicted from their homes, sometimes by the police, because their landlords have made their rent unaffordable. I see neighbors experiencing homelessness, trying to create a safe space and a safe community for themselves, only to have their encampments bulldozed and their belongings destroyed. I see so many ways that $50 million could be invested to make this city safer. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Toronto, my parents always taught me that people living on the street or people suffering with mental health or addiction issues weren't bad people. They were people who didn't have, have access to the same choices we did or the same resources we did. Because we were fortunate, it was our job to use our resources to help those less fortunate than us. I do not see my neighbors who are struggling as people who have failed, nor do I see them as a threat to my safety. I see them as people who have been failed by our government, as people who do not have access to the same choices or the same safety nets that the more affluent members of our city do. When I see my tax dollars being spent on clearing a homeless encampment in the middle of winter, it does not make me feel safer. When I see the most vulnerable members of our community being treated like criminals for circumstances beyond their control, it does not make me feel safer. But affordable housing, poverty reduction strategies, community crisis response teams, and affordable and reliable transit are just some of the strategies that could truly make the city safer for everyone, not just the rich and privileged. Mayor Tory recently defended this budget on CBC's Metro Morning, saying that the best study that he recently participated in was an election. With deep respect, the voter turnout in our last election was less than 30%, which, if my research is correct, was the lowest turnout since 1998. The people who cast a ballot for Mayor Tory in this election do not necessarily speak for the whole city on this issue. I am here today to speak on behalf of my neighbors, to ask you to reconsider this increase, and to instead invest that $50 million into truly making our city safer and more livable for all Torontonians. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. Do we have any questions? You're responsible. Do, do you have any questions? Okay, so um, are you aware that the mayor got more votes than all the councillors put like together? To uh, no, I was not aware of that. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Next, uh, next comment, uh, next, uh, Madam uh, Chair, can you please, excuse me, excuse on a me. point of personal privilege, Madam Chair, I don't believe that we're here to debate uh, deputants. We're here to listen to the opinions of the people of Toronto. And sir, I don't think it's appropriate for you to be arguing with people or calling them out. And I expect, Madam Chair, that in fact, we shouldn't be applauding, which we don't normally do. We can wave, we can, but we have to treat each other with respect here, and there's a difference of opinion. Uh, please, let's not uh, once again grill the deputants or um, or show, you know, the disdain in this way. I think I think it's incumbent on you, Madam Chair, to make sure that this is a respectful process. Well, this is a respectful process, uh, but when deputants are making a deputation on behalf of the budget, uh, it's the right of the um, um, the budget committee to ask questions to clarify any of the comments that they made. That's why we're here. 
Uh, and is it uh, is it acceptable for a uh, member of the audience? No, it's not to acceptable. To be yelling out. So can you please yes. tell the gentleman to not behave that way anymore? Yes, thank you. Our next deput uh, deputant is Rosalie Wislinkle. Rosalie. Rosalie. No. No. Is it virtual? No. Thank you. Next deputant is Laura Lindbergh. Laura, are you here? Okay, Laura, you have five minutes. <laughs> thank you. Five minutes. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share my thoughts on the city budget. My name is Laura Lindbergh. I live in the wonderful Ward 2. Good to see you, Councillor. And I love this part of our great city. It is so wonderful. I have a business background, and like all of you, I have become increasingly concerned with climate change. As a result, I've actually started my own sustainability consultancy to offer information and inspiration. And we each have our own reasons, right? to be worried about climate change. Maybe it's your children, maybe your grandchildren, maybe nature. I was so, so proud when the city passed its accelerated net zero by 2040 target. We must, must ensure we are on track to achieve it. There are other concerns in the near term, inflation, maybe a recession, but the climate crisis is truly unlike any other crisis. Mostly it's not visible. So it's really easy to push off the investments to a later year, or sadly, maybe to a later generation. And it has some uncertainty, yes. How catastrophic will it be? And when? And where? Yes, uncertainties. But unlike other crises, the climate crisis is going to be longer and larger. So you've probably heard that every job is a climate job. I believe that. What you do, each of you, on climate is going to be your legacy and my legacy for our children, our grandchildren, my, my hypothetical future grandchildren, <laughs> and nature. So I respectfully ask that you dramatically increase the spending on climate actions exactly in line with what Transform TO requires. And the additional costs, I believe, to our city if we delay, are going to make things like inflation and recessions seem like minor issues. The more, the more we spend now, the less we'll have to spend later. And there's so many best practices to choose from. We're a C40 member, so you already have access to all the greatest ideas. And Toronto is Canada's biggest city, so what we do, what you do, matters so much to all of Canada and to the rest of the world. So I'm just going to speak really briefly to the two biggest sources of Toronto's emissions, transportation and buildings. So on transportation, in addition to just buying the, the, you know, the new electric buses and city fleet, there's probably a ton of planning work that needs to be done. Where are all those buses going to be housed? Where are we going to put all of the battery maintenance and storage and uh, and charging infrastructure, uh, what are all the new skills and training that are required, how do we hire those people? Let's move on that so that that is not our backlog. I just, I'm, I've been so inspired by stuff that I've learned on transit in reading about many cities that have made their transit system the default. Big cities making transit the default. I mean, if people knew that every bus would have a maximum wait of 10 to 15 minutes, had dedicated lanes, had lots of routes, and that they could wait in a nice, large, well-lit, safe bus shelter, who would use their car? And then soon, who would bother owning a car? And then let's add to that super high parking fees and free passes for seniors, students, and low-income residents, and suddenly you have transit transformation. And other cities have done this. We can do this too. Now the cost, right? Oh, the cost. I'm sure there's lots of ideas, but one of them that I listened to recently with interest was T's proposal to add a commercial parking levy to fund the gap. 
I fully support this idea, and I know it's been proposed before. And I heard the mayor's concerns on the radio on some of the logistics. So if there are logistical concerns, why don't we add two or three cents to fund those concerns? And then if we don't need them, then we, we ratchet it back. But let's put extra money in to make sure that we can do that. But maybe it's just time to look at it again and try it. Let's just experiment. I drive when I can't take transit. But I would not be averse to a high parking fee. And I personally don't know anyone who would. Buildings, that's another big project. Can you please wrap it up? It's over five minutes. I'm sorry. Um, buildings is another huge opportunity. Retrofits, heat pumps, very little information to thank be found. Would be wonderful if we could do it. So please thank, thank don't you. underfund climate. Thank, thank you so you. much for your time. Questions? Questions? Um, just a question. As yes, far as the parking levy, um, we, um, uh, we've been speaking to some of the BIAs where, as you know, that during the pandemic, a lot of these small businesses uh, have gone out of business and they're just trying to survive now. And so if you put the parking levy, it not just impacts the big malls, it also impacts the churches, community centers, strip malls, all these small businesses that are trying to survive. Um, so are, are you aware that this, this would have a huge impact and the revenue generated would not be as much as uh, you anticipate? I think there have been several studies on it, so I'm sure you have far more information on it than I do. When the pandemic started, what I did was I completely changed my shopping habits and went only to small business. I understand it. I'm a small business myself now. And I'm sure you could exempt the smallest businesses, you could exempt churches, you could exempt small strip malls. I'm sure that there are ways in all of these reports to figure out how we could do it equitably. Um, and I'm sure you're more of an expert on that than I am. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Our next deputant is Kara Padavani. You have five minutes. Hmm? Yeah. Five minutes. I'd like to begin by thanking city staff for all of your hard work on this budget and of course to the budget committee and city council for allowing me to speak with you today. My name is Chiara Padavani, and I'm here on behalf of North York Harvest, the primary food bank serving northern Toronto since 1986. I'm here to ask our city government to increase funding to the poverty reduction strategy. At North York Harvest Food Bank, our network consists of 40 agencies who are seeing 20,000 visits per month to food banks. This is more than 50% higher than pre-pandemic service levers, levels. And one thing I really want to emphasize is that food bank use is continuing to increase. From last year, food bank, food bank use has increased 16%. So things were really bad at the peak of the pandemic, but they are getting worse. While food bank visits are increasing and skyrocketing and reaching record levels in this city, this city budget sees the lowest new investment in the poverty reduction strategy to date. We know from people coming to our food banks that the cost of living is weighing heavy, making it impossible for more and more people to make ends meet. After paying rent, the average person using a food bank has $8 to spend on food and all other expenses. That's $1 less than they had last year. Because of systemic racism and oppression for black, indigenous, and people of color, that daily budget drops to $7.75. And for newcomers to Toronto, that daily budget is less than $4. Less than $4 a day to spend on food, to spend on TTC fares, to spend on recreation services for your kids. While more and more people are struggling with the high cost of living to the extent that they are skipping meals, this city budget increases recreation fees and transit fares, 
and in fact it falls short on fully implementing the discounted fare pass which was supposed to be implemented in by 2021. Let's talk about housing. Almost seven in 10 food bank clients are paying more than half of their income on rent. Putting them at risk of homelessness with one in five, almost one in five food bank users paying all of their income on just rent with nothing left to spend on food or anything else. But while more and more people are turning to food banks because they cannot afford their rent, this budget has no increase to the rent bank or to the multi-unit residential acquisition MURA program to maintain and protect affordable housing units in the city. And in fact, this budget falls $7 million short on council's own commitment to that program. Our network of 40 agencies, our community partners, and the people who run them have stepped up to meet unprecedented and record levels of food insecurity over the last three years. And I cannot thank them enough for their service to our communities. But what we are hearing from them constantly is that they are over capacity and overwhelmed. But despite that, this budget flatlines the community partnership and investment program, an effective cut to funding, not keeping up with inflation for the first time I'm aware of, and forcing these exact same community organizations to do more with less. On behalf of North York Harvest Food Bank, I'm here to tell you that food banks cannot solve the problem of food insecurity and poverty. We are doing everything we can to meet this demand, but we are reaching our limit. And that's why we are urgently looking to the mayor, to our city government, to use this budget to take action on poverty and increase funding at the very least to the poverty reduction strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Holliday, question. Thank you for speaking to us. Um, why do you believe it's the city government that needs to solve food insecurity and poverty? Now, I've taken your, a little liberty on your words, but I I'm, I'm take it that that's the suggestion. Just philosophically. I believe it's the responsibility of every level of government to solve poverty and food insecurity. And I focused my deputation today on the aspects of the poverty reduction strategy that fall completely under municipal jurisdiction. Okay, so which, which are those? Which are those municipal jurisdictions that you feel strongly about? The Fair Fair Pass program, which was supposed to be implemented in 2021. I'd love to see that program fully implemented. Instead, this budget is looking to increase transit fares, uh, which will disproportionately impact the people using our services. Um, the MURA program, like I said, $7 million short on council's own commitment to that program to protect affordable housing units in the city. And uh, the partnership, uh, investing in partnerships and communities program, that funding by the city has been flatlined, which is a cut to community service organizations that are already under such immense pressure to meet these increasing needs that we're seeing in our community. Would you agree that provincial and federal governments, by virtue of their ability to raise taxes through income tax, are better positioned to deal with situations of income inequality? I can assure you, Councillor Holliday, that I will be making similar deputations to our provincial and federal governments to tackle income inequality and poverty in our country and in our province. There are many, many income revenues that the city is not yet taking advantage of. We can increase the vacancy home tax, implement a luxury home tax, the commercial parking levy, which we've been hearing about. There are other revenue tools that the city can be taking advantage of that fall under municipal jurisdiction to increase funding to this program, to increase funding to the provincial or the poverty reduction strategy. So that's what I'm looking for our provincial government to do. I'm not asking hmm. our municipal government to do more than what is within our jurisdiction to commit to. I, and it, please appreciate their philosophical questions, but- I always yeah, do, yeah, Councillor yeah, Holliday. Yeah, I spend yeah. a lot of time thinking philosophically. I, I, I get it, and that's why I wanna ask. Um, so you did, you raised the specter of additional tax avenues 
do you advocate from a philosophical sense that the city government should be more or additionally into the business of income redistribution because of those tools? Or, or would you rather see it left to the provincial and federal government? Whether or not you agree or disagree with the level at which they do it, um, from a governance or a, a division of roles, would you rather see it left to those orders? I'm not entirely sure if I understand the question, Councillor Holliday, but I would say that revenue tools, whether they are city, provincial, or federal, should absolutely be looking at implementing them uh, through an equity lens where the folks who have the most pay a little bit more and the folks who don't pay less. Okay, maybe just to reconfirm or round it out, your advocacy would be for the city to increase the use of revenue tools or taxes to increase income redistribution programs. I to get more into the business of it. I would like to see the poverty reduction strategy have increased funding. How okay. City Council decides to do that um, can be through increasing revenues by taking advantage of new revenue sources, or can be through realigning some of the priorities that Council has. Fair enough, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bravo, question? Since we were talking about issues of philosophy, um, I just wanted to um, check in on one thing. It's my understanding that federal and provincial governments have made uh, policy and funding decisions that have harmed our, um, the city's or every municipality's ability to meet um, needs and also have left the city governments uh, with holding the, the, um, the responsibility for dealing with the outcome of those bad policies, like around housing, et cetera, m massive tax cuts to the wealthy and, and, and massive corporate tax cuts. It sounded to me like what you're saying is that the needs are so great um, and that given the lack of supports that we have currently from federal and provincial governments, that we would turn to Torontonians that are, have, for example, um, a vacant home to ask them to, to pay instead of like 1%, maybe like Vancouver's now charging 5% for a vacant homes tax. And you mentioned some other uh, forms of taxation. Uh, do you, uh, is it because you wanna make sure that we're meeting the needs that you're seeing and at the food bank and elsewhere? Yes, of course. The food banks and our, our network can definitely sympathize with city government's frustration when you have to respond to provincial and federal policies that put bigger stress on the city government because food banks were supposed to be a stopgap solution, right, to poverty. We were supposed to just be a, a temporary fix, but we have become more and more needed and have become more and more relied on to serve low-income communities, to make sure people can put food on the table and I am here to say that we cannot solve this problem. We cannot solve poverty and food insecurity. And depending on us to do that is going to doom us for failure. And finally, in, in a con cost constrained environment in which we find ourselves, um, you mentioned MIRA, which is a, um, to secure affordable, existing affordable housing. There's also the EPIC, which is eviction, eviction prevention program. There's the rent bank that hasn't been increased. Would you say that the city has to pay in other ways when people become homeless, they're evicted or they lose their housing because they can't afford to pay their rent? Absolutely. The cost of not preventing poverty is far more expensive um, through homelessness, through health care. We see that that cost you know, down the line is much more expensive if we take Preventative measures today, we will be saving fiscally uh, tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Our next deputant is Jay Scott. Jay Scott? Present. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You have, uh, Jay, you have five minutes. Thank you. I'd like to thank the budget committee for allowing us to comment on the budget for this coming year. 
Uh, I'm a resident, uh, my name's Jay Scott, as you heard. I, I'm a resident of Ward 5. Um, and uh, I have a presentation that I'm going to basically read. Two allocations in this budget are particularly unpalatable, and as you heard over and over again yesterday, I'm not alone in finding them deeply problematic for many of the same reasons as expressed by previous deputants. The first is the 48.3 million increase to the police budget over last year's funding level, giving the police paramilitary powers and more literal cudgels to deal with poverty as they use force to destroy encampments is simply cruel and no way for an enlightened and compassionate society to address the most abject human misery. In a CBC interview on January 16th, newly elected Councillor Malik suggested that up to 18,000 people in Toronto now experience homelessness. I hope we never have sufficient police to bully them out of the only shelters they've been able to scrabble together merely to survive and to use a portion of that financial gravy to provide more armed enforcers in the transit system is also unacceptable, targeting, as they undoubtedly will, indigent members of society, bringing in a bully force just as fares are to go up, and as service cuts are implemented, is simply cynical and unnecessarily punitive when the recommendations going forward are to making transit free, as it is currently for some members of society. However, according to one source, this performance of police and similar enforcers to harass the poor and homeless appears to be intentional. Quote, by percentage, the biggest spending increases are going forward to the Office of Emergency Management and the Mayor's Office. For the Office of Emergency Management, the increase is due to providing funding for 10 positions to, quote, support the management of encampments, close quote. My recommendation is that the police get not one more cent to persist in their incompetence to handle poverty, homelessness, and the mental issues of unhoused and racialized residents. Due to the ongoing evidence of excessive use of force, the existing police budget should be cut progressively year by year so that they are not the second largest slice of Toronto's budget. In fact, in 2023, they should give up 9% of their existing budget to cover the service cuts to the TTC, because transit is now also acting as shelters for members of our community living on the street. Another serious objection is to spending two billion to refurbish the gardener instead of improving transit in order to improve our air quality and an urgent reduction in emissions. Wasn't that the point of declaring a climate emergency as far back as 2019? So I recommend closing the gardener entirely and redirecting the funds saved by implementing transform TO and net zero commitments through, but not limited to, the funding of housing retrofits and active transportation measures. The proposed 9% cut in TTC service times and the increase in fares are particularly egregious since they appear to be part of the funding vehicle to fix those problematic spending allocations. A failure to augment service rather than improve it will undoubtedly lead to lower ridership with a further loss in revenue. And so transit's downward spiral continues year after depressing year. The property tax increase for this year, which I've supported in the past, is useful only if some of the most questionable expenditures come off the table. A tax height alone, without implementing and enforcing a more comprehensive plastics ban, and addressing housing retrofits, transit, food security, and mental health issues, among others, is unacceptable and feels irresponsible. In addition to not approving some of the proposed expenditures, there are suggestions to address the city's huge shortfalls with, ensu excuse me, with ensuing impacts on our climate crisis. One recommendation is to enact a commercial parking levy. Other revenue generation could come from raising the cost of parking, redirecting to the city a portion of income tax and a recovery of one cent of the sales tax that would include a mechanism to provide rebates to low-income residents. Too few allocations in the proposed uh, budget will lead to reduction in emissions, temperature rise, or progressive equi equity for all residents. All signs point for the need to act immediately with every means at the city's disposal 
to halt a devastating climate catastrophe. Can you please wrap it up? You're over five minutes. Thank you very much for this opportunity to comment. Thank you. Pardon? Yes. Question, Councillor Holliday. Yes. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd take the chance because the, the parking levy has come up uh, by many people. And I, I'm going to guess there's probably many different thoughts to it. But how would you envision that being applied? You know, wh who would we charge a levy to and in what locations and who would pay it? Oh, well, I, I imagine the city would have the resources to do that uh, oh, analysis. Sure. But, but who? Where, 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 you, you know, citizen, where would you where would you like to see those taxes go? Like like, I should frame it correctly. Come from where? where yeah, come from. Thank you. Where, what what spots would you like us to to put a levy on? Well, I think uh, commercial, large commercial enterprises, uh, the malls, for malls. one. Okay. Um, and perhaps where uh, residents come into large parking lots to from outside the city to uh, ent enter the city and conduct business here, that, that could be a source as well. I understand that they, uh, there's concern about small malls with uh, struggling businesses, so perhaps those would be uh, taxed at a lower rate. Well, let, let's play that out. Um, sure way. Do you know sure way? I've been there. Right. A few so, times. Yeah, <laughs> as I think uh, only of, a few. <laughs> as most in the room, how do you think it would play out at, say, Sherway, for example? Um, suddenly, the the landlord gets a tax bill for a lot of money. It's a big parking lot. What what do you think what would happen? How would this play out? I just and and I just I want to do the thought process because I want to make sure that you're happy with this. What do you think would happen next? Would well, we, if that's the way it's collected, I think that's problematic. Well, how else would they collect it? Well, at the entrances. Oh. Oh, so, okay, so the vision is if you drive into the lot, you'd... That's a suggestion you're asking. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. all right. So, yeah, so that, that's very helpful because that's totally different than what I thought, and that's the purpose of the question. So mm -hmm. the idea would be something that's paid for by the driver as opposed to the landlord. Yeah, I think it's less uh, okay. administrative hassle and uh, probably fairer. Okay, no, I appreciate it, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank oh. you. you. Was there a question? Um, no. no. Our next deputant is Susan Bender. Susan, are you on the line? Hello. Hello, Susan. I'm uh, here. Okay. Thank you, Susan. I'm you here. Can you? Yeah. Susan, you have five minutes. Okay, Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm Bender. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the manager of the Toronto Drop in Network. I just want us to reflect a little bit about what we learned, uh, what positive things we learned during the pandemic. <coughs> First of all, we learned that neighbors will come together to help out neighbors. The mutual aid pods sprung up everywhere across the city. We learned that many Torontonians have a really deep commitment to caring for and defending each other's rights to physical, mental, and social safety. We saw this in the huge mobilization of people and resources to support our neighbors in tents and encampments. We also learned that when city staff and politicians sit down community members, groups, and organizations, when you truly listen and respect the on-the-ground information being shared with you, and then you mobilize all the resources you can access, truly transformative and life-saving things happen. Remember all the incredibly creative food security uh, initiatives that were implemented, the success of community-based vaccine clinics, community wellness, social inclusion, and safety were best safeguarded by community efforts in partnership with city staff and funded by all three levels of government. People powered these solutions, not the police. 
We need the commitment and funding to community-based solutions now, or the inequities that also became glaringly obvious during the pandemic will become even more deeply entrenched. The most important piece of any budget is adequate funding for the people who are the backbone of all the critical community services and programs that the city funds. The tireless and very difficult work of staff and managers across the city throughout the pandemic was recognized in part both by the provincial and SSHA's pandemic pay top-up programs. These programs, however, were short-term. Community organizations continue to struggle to recruit and to keep staff. And staff continue to struggle to make ends meet working multiple jobs, traveling really long distances from housing they can afford to where their workplaces are, and actually leaving the not-for-profit sector for work, uh, wages they can live on. Constant undervaluing of care work and those who do it continues to result in chronic government underfunding. And who's doing this work? In drop-ins and shelters as street outreach workers, staff are predominantly black, people of color, women and a growing number of people with lived experience often referred to as peers i'm very pleased and encouraged to see that ssha budget includes funding to work towards wage parity between staff and directly operated shelters and purchase of service shelters operated by community partners i urge this committee and the council to request similar plans for the housing and homelessness sector as a whole and to allocate resources to ensure that we can attract and keep staff and to start to address deep inequities in wages and benefits in this sector. You know, staff don't only run the day-to-day -day services that help people uh, meet their basic needs. They also build the long-term relationships with individuals that support safety in the, in the program space as well as in the wider community. And relationships that can lead to better health, access to housing options, integration into work and into the community. We need good staff and we need to keep, we need them to stay. I believe, I really believe that staff understand, city staff understand this crisis and the urgent need for redress. The recent open call for funding by SSHA and the housing secretariat encourage applicants to submit budgets with the real costs of their programs, including wages and benefits. However, very few of the organizations that applied in that TDIN surveyed actually received the full amount they requested. Some organizations lost staff either because of funding cuts or reductions or because of job security that insecurity that drove staff to find jobs elsewhere. The ongoing cycle of recruitment and onboarding costs organizations a lot of time and money, but the impact on community programs and the people who use them is, is, is immeasurable. The City of Toronto already requires that wages paid to workers on city contracts meet the requirements of the fair wage policy. City budgets should build in similar approach to raise the floor of wages for staff working in the community organizations that the city relies on to deliver housing and homelessness programs. Take a first step now to begin to address the human resources crisis, and it is a crisis that is threatening the very sustainability and the success of community-based programs. It can, is very much worse. Can you please wrap it up? You're over five minutes. I'm finished. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Our next deputant is Katie Carey. <clears throat> Hi, um, I hope you can bear with me. This is my first time doing something like this. Um, but I wanted to come to speak to the Budget Committee today. Um, I live in Ward 12. I can barely afford my rent. And yet, so many of my neighbors are in much, much worse positions than I am. Neighbors that are on the verge of becoming homeless and neighbors that are already homeless. And it's those people that I would like to uh, speak to today. The f um, all last week, I, for the first time ever, I watched the, um, the committee for the Toronto Police Services. I watched the committee that met to discuss the shelter hotels. And I watched the committee um, that debated the warming centers. 
And it was extremely, extremely frustrating to watch expert after expert after expert give deputations that provided real concrete evidence and facts for why social services in this city should get increased funding. It was extremely frustrating watching the Toronto Police Services Committee uh, where police did not provide evidence of what that increased funding will go to. They were unclear about how that money will be allocated and they were unable to provide evidence that increased policing increases safety in our communities. I have facts and figures here from TPS's own data that in fact from 2000 to 2020, major crime in the city, major violent crimes, homicides and shootings, much like the ones that Councillor Nunziata was referencing earlier today, are in fact down. Um, so I would also like to address you, Councillor Crisanti, when you mentioned the, um, I believe, 650 police officers um, that we've lost in the last few years. Well, crime is actually going down. So the loss of those police officers has not actually resulted in an increase in violent crime. So there isn't evidence that more policing keeps our communities safe. In fact, again, the facts and figures shared by many, many, many experts at these deputations, at these various committees, prove otherwise that in fact, they know where that money needs to go and they can show evidence that it works, that it keeps our communities safe. I have a personal um, story to share because I'm not one of those experts. I hope you listen to them. I hope you listen to their evidence. I'm here to share a personal story today. Um, I spent all last week in hospital with my father who has uh, advanced dementia. We spent uh, two days in the ER alone and I spent 24 hours sitting with him in the hallway of the ER. Um, he can't be left alone. Across from us on another stretcher in the hallway of the ER uh, was an unhoused gentleman who was there for I'm sure a number of reasons, um, including access to a warm space in addition to the medical care and other services he required. So as I sat with my father for 24 hours in the hallway of the ER, and he was unable to get the care that he needed, I also saw this unhoused gentleman across from us unable to get the care that he needed. And so what did that mean? It meant a gentleman who would not be able to receive the care he needed. He did not need emergency medical services. He needed multiple social services, mental health services, um, medical services provided in a non-emergency setting to assist him. Was he able to access those there? No, the ER is not where that person is able to access those services. Staff spent time with this gentleman attempting to assist him, knowing full well that they are unable to assist that man with what his needs are, that they are unable to provide those social services. And it meant that my dad didn't get the care as quickly as he needed it. This unhoused gentleman didn't, uh, wasn't able to access the services that he needed. He, in fact, left towards the end of the evening um, untreated and to just go out and onto the street. And critical, critical, overworked and burnt out staff in the ER had to spend time and energy and resources attempting to help someone that they know they can't help. Um, these are the kind of situations we're gonna see more and more and more. In fact, several, so many deputants spoke, ER doctors spoke um, to the fact that ERs have now become uh, de facto warming centers for unhoused people. Um, so this is just gonna keep happening more and more. Uh, we're seeing this, we're seeing this across the city uh, that poverty levels are increasing, unhoused people are increasing. And um, the idea that we would fund $50 million to a service, again, 
that is not providing evidence that they keep our communities safe, it's unconscionable. Can you please wrap it up? So I implore you today um, to think about sending that money to where it's actually needed and where the community actually wants it. Thank, thank you. you. Questions, Councillor Holliday? Um, thank you for speaking to us and telling us of a very real story and perhaps many of us may have experienced something similar. So my question is, do you think the man should have been allowed to leave? I'm sorry? Do you think the man should have been allowed to leave the hospital? I'm not sure how that's a relevant question. I'm not a medical professional, so that wouldn't be no, no, my you decision. Said, you talked about it. And so what, what I'm getting at is, what do you think the solution was for the man? Uh, um, I think I made it clear that the uh, services that that man needed to access could not be provided by ER doctors and nurses. Got it. Yeah. What do you think he did need, though? Uh, I didn't... <laughs> yeah, I actually had someone in my own care. So the Please, idea that I we need to... If we want to have a conversation, we can. Okay, hold but... on. Please, no disruptions, please. I, Thank I'm just, you. I'm just trying to understand. You were advocating... For Counselor, in all fairness, I don't... Council, okay. please. I, I, I'm going to stop, Madam Chair, because okay. it's not it's not unfolding in an orderly way. So I, I'll yeah. stop. I, I, I'm 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 actually going to respond to you, Councillor. Um, I think it's unfair to suggest that I should know specifically what that individual required. Um, okay. I'm not sure how to continue answering that, but I would like to point out that your line of questioning has been extremely disingenuous today. Thank you. I, I don't know if I should be insulted or well, not. Well, I, you know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you have Thank it. Thank you. No, this five Thank minutes you. was not up, Councillor Bravo. Um, any further questions? No further questions? Okay. Yes. Our next deputant is Brian Deuce-Wright. Brian? Just uh, to blur my background because I'm working from home, unfortunately. But okay. sorry, just excuse my background. Yeah, no, it's okay. Into it. So, Brian, we um, can we can see and hear you. So, you have five minutes. Okay, thank perfect. you. Thank you. So, thank you to the budget committee and others uh, for allowing me to speak to you today. My name is Brian Duthright, and I am a housing worker at the Weston King Neighborhood Center. I just wanted to state that my opinions are my own. I'm not speaking on behalf of the organization, but I am also sharing my and my colleagues' experience as frontline workers. So the Weston King Neighborhood Center is a drop-in located in the York Southwestern Ward, which is at Weston Road in Lawrence. We serve low to no income persons, newcomers, marginalized groups, underhoused persons, and as well persons experiencing houselessness. Um, so, as I'm looking at the current budget and comparing it with previous budgets, I do not see an appropriate answer to the housing and houselessness crisis that is at a critical level. I am sure you have all heard the numbers about a woeful lack of shelter space. Like last August, 80% of people calling central intake for shelter were told no space is available. And how houselessness in Toronto has increased by 24% between 2021 and 2022 and to an astonishing estimate of about 18,000 people. So we need our leaders to respond to this crisis through substantial investment into social housing and to the shelter and drop-in network. Moreover, funding to the shelter and drop-in network has not reflected either inflation or the growing levels of poverty, which puts a further demand on the underfunded nonprofit sector. This underfunding also passes the responsibility of sheltering the unhoused population to public institutions like hospitals, TTC, libraries, and prisons. If we don't pay to address houselessness through substantial housing investments, we will pay for it at much higher cost in hospitals and in prisons. I will share with you a few stories that illustrate the disturbing reality of housing and houselessness in Toronto. After not being able to find shelter for a woman fleeing domestic violence, we gave her a Tim Hortons 
backyard rather than her returning to an abusive environment. When she found out no shelter would be available, she had an anxiety attack with chest pains and had to be taken to the hospital. This doesn't have an emotional just this doesn't just have an emotional toll. It puts in an unnecessary unnecessary expense on our healthcare system. If this happened to her, it happened to others as well, like we have heard from other people uh, providing deputations. Another story is of a senior that that was in the hospital for a serious condition and when discharged, the shelters were full and she spent a week sleeping outside. This was a senior. After weeks of sleeping outside, her medical condition worsened, so she had to just be rehospitalized. This is just a cycle that happens for so many people and it it really does not help anybody closed or getting the medical care that they need. If if she had at least had shelter to go to, she wouldn't have had to go back to the hospital. Another example is on multiple occasions, myself or colleagues have had serious discussions with participants about them debating whether or not they should break the law and purposely get it so they can just be housed in prison. There again, we are paying for houselessness through inappropriate, ridiculous means and adding additional cost of human suffering. So as you can hear, the result of, cri of this crisis is something I see every day at work where I'm constantly calling central intake to find shelter for a participant just to have the expected call back in one to two hours response. After calling all day with no luck finding shelter, the only thing we can do is give the person a Tim Hortons gift card, point them to the nearest 24 hour location, give, uh, give them a TTC fare to ride transit, or if the weather is okay, a sleeping bag in a tent. In one of the wealthiest cities in the world, it is, it is a disgrace we continue to deny people their fundamental right to housing. I know there has been a small increase in shelter support and housing administration, but this does not match with inflation and the growing demand. I am requesting that you allocate further funds to, so this crisis can be addressed in the areas, not in hospitals and prisons. And thank you for your time. And just to answer that last question, that gentleman probably needed assistance through shelter is probably what the answer would be to that. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you very much. Our next deputant is Melissa Goldstein. Melissa, are you on the uh, line? Okay, Melissa, you have five minutes. Sorry, I was just going to. Thanks so much for having okay. me today. We've been hearing an awful lot about the need for more shelter spaces and, and respite space and the need for more affordable housing and more housing in general, all things that I strongly support. But today I want to talk a bit about the need to preserve the affordable housing that currently exists in the private rental market. These are units that are largely affordable only because the tenants of the these units have lived there a long time and rent control has prevented the landlords from raising the rents above what the province allows each year. Because these tenants pay lower the market rents, they are at risk of eviction by a landlord looking for opportunities to legally or illegally so they can double the rent, by a developer who wants to redevelop the property into a more lucrative building like a luxury rental or an expensive condo. When tenants are evicted, we affordable housing stock. We have been losing affordable housing stock far faster than we have been building it for many years now. But this is even more true today as a result of sorry, unfavorable conditions for housing development that have caused significant project delays and cancellations. Meanwhile, the hemorrhaging of existing affordable units has sped up. And at this rate, we are never going to see a net increase in the supply of affordable housing in Toronto. And what we will see is continued growth in homelessness not from refugees or people coming from other municipalities, but local people who are forced out of their homes by landlords looking to make bigger profits and people redeveloping existing properties, ironically, as a way to address our affordable housing crisis. This budget needs more funding to preserve affordable housing and prevent more people from becoming homeless. The most effective and efficient program the city has to preserve existing affordable housing for the long term is the MURA program. MURA puts money in the hands of nonprofit organizations to quickly purchase existing rental buildings and prevent the tenants from being evicted and the rents from being raised. The buildings remain affordable in perpetuity. This budget proposes a total of $10 million for MURA with $3 million budgeted this year and $7 million budgeted next year. 
$3 million is a pittance given the number of at-risk homes this program can preserve. The Housing Secretariat sets a target for this money of 120 units, or $80,000 a unit. This target is unreasonable, unfortunately. 60 units, or $150,000 a unit, is more likely, according to one of the organizations involved in this program currently. But even still, at $150,000 for an affordable unit through Mura, this is a great value for money when building a new affordable unit now costs something like $700,000 to $1 million a unit. It makes sense given the development environment that the budget for new affordable housing is reduced from previous years this year. This year, the budget is about 60% of what was originally budgeted in 2021 and 2022. What makes sense is that none of the roughly $200 million in capital funding that was cut from the affordable housing budget was invested in Mira instead, when half of this money could have resulted in 650 homes being preserved as affordable housing permanently. The $48 million being given to the police budget, in case you were curious, could preserve about 320 units as permanent affordable housing and prevent 320 tenants from losing their homes. Preservation of existing affordable housing and the pre prevention of homelessness through acquiring housing properties is only one avenue the city needs to be investing in. The city also needs to invest in funding for programs that help people hold on to the housing they already have and prevent being evicted. While it's great to see EPIC receiving additional funding, the pro program only helps people on social assistance and it isn't designed to help tenants who are being forced out by predatory landlords, which is from so many tenants of all income levels are facing today. For renters who aren't on social assistance, the programs they rely on aren't seeing any increased investment, even though the need for support is growing substantially. For every tenant who is able to remain in their home, a unit of housing stays affordable or at least more affordable than it would be if the tenant were forced to move out and homelessness Prevented. It's unclear why in the middle of a housing affordability and homelessness crisis, the city isn't making funding and expanding these programs and services that help tenants remain housed a priority. Further, the city's new multi-tenant housing framework puts tenants living in properties that need expensive upgrades to meet code requirements at risk of eviction. Investment in a program that gives subsidized, so, sorry, that subsidizes renovations in exchange for providing affordable rents is needed. In sum, this budget invests as little resources as possible on addressing the needs of the people in greatest need, while crying for and punting the responsibility for adequately funding affordable housing, shelter and eviction prevention programs, among many, many other things that should be budget priorities to the provincial and federal governments. At the same time, John Tory's personal priorities, like police, fire, highways, and his own office budget, are not only fully funded, but are seeing significant budget increases. This is a political choice being made here. The city could wait for funding from other levels of government okay. to add more funds to the police and, and to highway repairs. Can you but please, is instead choosing to can leave you please, to be, Can you please wrap it up? I will wrap up? it up in one moment. Yes. Yeah. But okay. instead, he's choosing to let Torontonians freeze it up on the street while waiting to see if the, more funding comes. Thank you. We could do it the other way around. Thank you. Money to come thank, to police. Thank, thank you. you. Questions? Okay, um, are you aware that uh, the city is spending $2 billion in gross spending uh, in the budget and uh, $660 million direct uh, support for housing initiatives, which includes 18, over $18 million for the multi-use uh, unit residential program? Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Our next deputant is Mike Creek. Mike, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And okay, thank just, you for the just one sec. Okay, we can hear you. Uh, I mean, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Okay, Mike, do you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, thanks to the staff for arranging all of this today. My name is Michael Creek. I use the pronouns he and him, and I live in Ward 13 and work in Ward 4. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Working for Change. Working for Change is a grassroots organization built by community members to create our own solutions of the poverty, stigma, and various forms of marginalization. Rooted in the psychiatric survivor and that pride movement, Working for Change believes strongly in the wisdom, values, skills of people 
with lived experience of mental health addiction, homelessness, trauma, newcomer, and refugee challenges. We manage four social enterprises in the city of Toronto. By working for change, we believe in a home, a job, a friend, and social change. We are also a member of the GTA Disability Coalition. Our community has really faced significant challenges over the last few years with COVID, having a deep impact on our folks. Our community members are facing multiple challenges that are not fully addressed in the 2023 budget. We feel that it does not go far enough in meeting the systemic inequalities and the importance of investing in people. I listened in, I have listened in on some of the deputations must agree that some very strong cases were made by our fellow citizens and community leaders to for, do more for those who are structurally vulnerable. Although there may be many areas that I would like to speak about today, I will choose to keep it to two areas. We would like to ask that a significant investment be made in the City of Toronto's poverty reduction strategy, moving forward aggressively on the fair, fair pass, and strong investments in supporting folks to move into employment opportunities. We know that employment is a social connector for many folks, and the vast majority of folks want to work. When possible, we don't, have, we don't have enough pathways of opportunities for our folks with disabilities to be supported on this journey. We would ask that we move directly into stage four, the fair, fair pass, increase funding and opportunities for employment for people in poverty, including folks with disability across all city services, Increase funding for the EPIC eviction prevention program, increase funding for the mirror program to protect affordable housing for Toronto residents, and increase investments in warming and cooling centers and work towards uh, housing with universal design. Poverty is a violation of people's human rights. We are moving towards a framework to ensure that housing rights are embedded in our actions at the city. I have to, from my personal experiences, I know that poverty steals from your soul. It crushes the rewards that life may bring to each of us. When combined with homelessness, addictions, mental health, and disability, it can suck the life of you. We must do better. We cannot police ourselves out of the social and economic disparities. We must look further upstream, make investments in people through policies and programs that end all forms of poverty. How can we help you? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, thank you very much for your deputation. Our next deputant is Andrea Atala. Andrea? Can you hear me? No? Uh oh. Um, I'm unmuted. Oh, it's a start video. Oh, okay. Okay, here I am. Yes, here you are. So, Andrea, you have five minutes. All right, thank you. Good afternoon to the Budget Committee. And thank you for allowing me to speak to you. Um, I'm Andrea Hatala, and I'm also here from the GTA Disability Coalition, um, but I'm providing some more personal um, examples of what the numbers mean. And um, I have a couple of concerns from the budget. Um, one is the, um, the cutting of service um, to TTC um, and in off hours. And um, people use TTC for the most part because they have no other choice. They have no other way of getting around the city. Um, and um, when, when you um, cut service to the TTC, it means that people have to wait longer. Um, people you know, people have to wait longer on the streets, sometimes like at night, um, depending on what your job is and, and, and when you use the TTC, you have to wait at night. 
Um, and, um, um, it, and it, and, you know, I had to wait for the 504 bus for about a half an hour. And this was before the cuts. Um, and, and so if, if you're, if you're decreasing the service, um, people will have to wait a longer time. And I'm, I'm concerned about this because in the dark and in the evening and in the winter, it'll make people feel cold and um, unsafe. Um, the other concern that I have is um, the, the um, is not giving inflationary increases to nonprofits. As you know, social assistance rates are too low. And though you cannot do anything about that, um, it is the nonprofits that fill the gap for people with disabilities. They provide meals to keep us fed and programs um, to cut down on social isolations and make, make poverty like a little bit more bearable. Um, and these, um, these ongoing, um, the organizations are lifelines to us. And, uh, because of inflation, um, uh, the donations um, that they get from fundraising um, activities may be lower, may be reduced. And so I would certainly hate to see um, them have to cut their programming um, because of the reduction in the city budget. So, um, so please um, think twice about about um, um, no, like about um, and and increase those um, and increase the budget to those organizations, not decrease it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? No, thank you very much for your deputation. Our next deputant is Alicia Douglas. Alicia, you have five minutes. Hello. Hi, my name is Alicia Douglas, and I am uh, I'm a citizen of Ward 14, and I am also a shelter support worker, but I'm not here representing the organization that I work for today. I'm here as a citizen. So I just wanted to start by first and foremost saying that uh, I don't envy your job. You have a very difficult one, um, and I recognize that. I, having said that, however, I do think that there could be improvements to this budget that has been proposed. And one in particular that I am here to talk uh, to specifically is the increase in policing. So I, I think that everyone here knows, and, and there's been lots of uh, testimonials talking about the increase in community building, in services, in programs, and how those preventative programs are actually fiscally responsible. Uh, they assist people, yes, they do have a human rights lens, which is all incredibly important, but I think that the most, you know, just talking budget financially wise, that it is a financial decision that is sound as well. Now, I'm sure that people have spoken to you before about different studies. I mean, the at-home Chez Soi one uh, is a good example. Um, I, I think that there's other ones that, that definitely spoke to the definitive um, helpfulness of preventative programs rather than increasing police budgets. But I'm sure that you've heard those all before. And again, I could go into uh, many stories as a shelter support worker, but um, I actually wanted to talk to you and um, about a personal story that uh, when I was working as a barista, something that happened. So I used to work in the downtown core for about four years. At first I was a barista and then I became a supervisor actually at that particular coffee shop. And what happened was because we were in the downtown core, we certainly attracted a very diverse uh, clientele. We had a lot of people coming in from doctors, lawyers, um, and then folks uh, who were experiencing homelessness. You know, didn't matter. Everybody uh, was there to just 
grab their coffee and go. Now, as a barista, I was definitely used to being yelled at. Um, There were people who were disappointed with their orders, but there was one particular person who came in every single day. And uh, through context clues, we actually figured out that she was experiencing homelessness. And she would also tell us about sleeping rough. She would tell us about sleeping in different um, shelters, hostel space, come very agitated. And what we call that now um, in my line of work is you are above baseline. So you've been, become escalated. And so one day somebody just said to her, you know, do you want a glass of water? And she said, yeah, I'd love one. And she calmed right down. And it was you know, it wasn't magic. It wasn't anything that we had to to do. It wasn't anything that we couldn't offer. It was free. So that was easy. And then from then on, every single day that she came in, you know, she would tell us something. She would get really escalated. She would get very, very upset. And other people around her would start to get uncomfortable. And we would go, hey, do you need a glass of water? And she would calm down. And uh, she would say, yeah, I do. Thank you. And she would pay for her coffee and leave. Now, one day, uh, the only thing that was different about this day, um, you know, it was nice outside. It was, it was, you know, the middle of the day. It wasn't the very morning, so it really wasn't very busy. And this exact same woman came in, and it was the typical routine. But the only thing that was different this morning was there were actually seven Toronto police officers who were seated at a table at the back of uh, the cafe. And they overheard the conversation. And sometimes what she could say, she was experiencing a lot. She could really become very rough in her language. And so they approached us and they said, do you need help? And we said, no, we just need you. And before we could answer, those officers restrained her and made her leave. And they looked at us and they said, don't worry, you have nothing to worry about anymore. She won't be here to bother you. She never bothered us. So I think that uh, what I'm trying to say with my story is that programs, services, people knowing each other, just having that human connection, that's what's going to help the community. That's what's going to bring the community together and assist people, not more policing and not more punitive measurements. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Our next deputant is Rebecca Weigand. Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca, you have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Rebecca. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm here to talk about two things, climate change and homelessness. On climate, you know what we need, full funding for Transform TO, active transport, better public transport, zero emissions buildings, heat pumps, a lush tree canopy that will help cool the air on hot days throughout the city, especially in underserved areas. And the other day as I walked to my local organic grocery store, I had an experience like many of the other deputants today, I once again lost track of the number of homeless people I went past. I live close to downtown, although the problem exists here too, and I live with my six-year-old daughter. So when I take her out, I plan our route now to avoid the heaviest areas of homeless people and the tents in the park, park, but it's really almost impossible now. It's not the homeless people that I'm worried about her seeing. It's me her mother walking on past someone hungry and cold, offering little more than a smile or a few coins, maybe a woefully inadequate pair of socks. That's what I don't want her to see. It's our society that chooses who we care about and labels certain people as disposable that I don't want her to see. Climate change is intersectional. Homelessness is already at crisis levels in the city. Extreme weather, heat waves, and more unpredictable emergencies like COVID will continue to put greater pressure on homeless and vulnerable people in the coming years. Climate refugees will add to the pressure on our already broken system. Research over decades in Finland and other countries has shown that the most cost effective, the most effective way to reduce homelessness is by providing homes. You can't treat mental or physical health problems or address education or employability without the basic foundation of a home. 
and you definitely can't police away homelessness. The research and expertise is here. You've heard a lot of it today. You know what to do. I urge you to preserve and maintain affordable housing and invest heavily and creatively in long-term affordable and supportive housing and to collaborate with provincial and federal governments to address homelessness in the short and long term. As we implement Transform TO and develop a climate resilient city, which we so urgently need to do for our children and grandchildren, homes for everyone needs to be a number one priority in our vision of the better world we can create. Because each of us can only be okay if all of us are okay. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you very much for your deputation. Our next deputant is Liz Addison. Liz? Yes, I'm, I'm here and I, my camera is on. Okay, well, I'll just begin speaking, I suppose. Okay, you have five minutes. I'm not sure Liz. why my camera. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for this opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Liz Addison, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Climate Action Group, Climate Fest. I'm also a resident of Ward 11, where I'm one of the city's neighborhood climate action champions. Over the last several years, I've watched the city make ambitious, intelligent plans for dealing with the increasingly urgent climate crisis. The problem I see is that the resources available for implementing these plans are in no way equal to the task of getting the city's emissions to net zero by 2040. They are just not adequate. Recognizing that the city is dealing with one of the most difficult budget situations in its history, I've come to a number of conclusions. First, there is probably no way for the city to achieve its climate goals without massive funding from higher levels of government and the private sector. How to get this funding leads me to my next point. The city must mobilize its residents to demand greater provincial and federal funding through a massive campaign to make the general population aware of the climate crisis, its causes, its consequences, and realistic solutions. While there is no need to alarm people, there is no excuse for keeping them ignorant of the consequences of inaction. This climate engagement campaign can also motivate residents to reduce their own carbon footprints for, by, for example, installing heat pumps to heat their homes and to heat uh, their water, buying electric vehicles and using transit or active transportation. It's been suggested that about 40% of carbon emissions can be eliminated, eliminated through personal action. Given the enormous amount, uh, enormous demands on the public purse, the city must be more aggressive in generating new revenue. I support the many calls for a commercial parking levy, which, by the way, has been instituted in many other jurisdictions, including New York City, Montreal, Vancouver, Melbourne, S Sydney, and many others. Um, a municipal share in sales tax or income tax and, and any of the other revenue tools that have been studied by city staff. Revenues from, source, from sources such as these should be put specifically toward transit services, which should be enhanced rather than downgraded as has been proposed in this year's TTC budget. Transform TO calls for free public transit, free, as an important part of achieving the city's climate goals. Such revenues could also be directed toward improving infrastructure, the infrastructure of active transportation, like improved pedestrian and cycling paths. 
And finally, this is no time for the city to spend money unwisely. Improved planning would reduce inefficiencies in road repair. And I ask you, who hasn't seen roads dug up and repaved repeatedly and wondered why scheduling doesn't make this unnecessary? Expensive mega projects like reconstruction of the crumbling eastern section of the Gardner Expressway should also be reconsidered. In closing, I want to commend the city's efforts to date to reduce its carbon emissions, but I also urge you to work harder and smarter to put in place the resources needed to reach the city's climate goal of net zero by 2040. Thanks again for this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Our next deputy is Ellen Peters. Ellen? Can you see me? Yes. Yes, yes. we can see okay. and hear you. Afternoon. you. Ellen, you have five Excellent. minutes. Thank you. My name is Ellen Peters. I live in Ward 4. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I strongly believe that an effective city needs its citizens to be able to commute efficiently. Raising the fare and cutting service to TTC is going to have the opposite effect. A colleague bought a car, a used car, because relying on the TTC to get him to work made him angry. One of my neighbors started cycling because of, I'm not sure if you're aware of the disruption with the 504, but he started cycling to work because of that. Uh, I used to commute daily from Roncesvalles to Dixon and Kipling. Now, traveling from Ossington and college home fills me with anxiety. Will there be a streetcar? If it arrives, will it short turn at Lansdowne? I bought a monthly pass in April for the first time since the lockdown. I haven't bought one again because I would leave work, walk to the stop, and the ETA would be 20 to 40 minutes. Depending on the weather, I would walk or hail a cab or call for an Uber. The pass felt like a waste of money. Yet for decades, I had relied on the monthly MetroPass program. I used to love exploring the city. I stay in my neighborhood now. I supply teach at schools. I'm a retired element, semi-retired elementary school teacher. I supply teach at schools that I can walk to because I don't trust the TTC. I do my best to reduce my carbon footprint. No car, shop local, reuse, hang clothes to dry. I wear a sweater inside. I wish my city would do the same. Public transit is essential in a large city. However, TTC can no longer be relied upon. More service cuts will drive more people away, and in turn, the system will deteriorate further. It's important that Torontonians can get to and from work in a reasonable time frame. Don't cut the service, improve it. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, you have a question? Um, thank you for speaking to us, Ms. Peters. The intersection of Kipling and Dixon uh, on the south side is Ward 2. Did I understand correctly that you were having trouble with the bus at that location or was it somewhere else? No, um, that was before I retired. Okay. So that was my daily commute. That was when TTC was still working properly. Long trip. Yes, it was. It took anywhere between 50 minutes to an hour and 20. Okay, and, and sorry, I just want to be clear. Um, was, it, was it that spot where you were waiting 20 to 25 minutes for the bus? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, I, I retired before COVID, okay. and the deterioration has happened since COVID. So it's, um, it was actually on Dundas near Shaw. Okay, thank you for clarifying. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next deputy is you. Theodore Walker Robinson. Thank you. Thank okay, you Theodore, you have me. five minutes. Perfect. Thank you so thank much. You. 
Good afternoon, councilors, Mayor Tory, members of the budget committee. Uh, I'm Theodore Walker Robinson, executive director of Lakeshore Arts, and I'm speaking to you today on behalf of the six local arts service organizations, LASSOs, as we call ourselves, uh, of Toronto, and they are Arts Etobicoke, East End Arts, Lakeshore Arts, where I'm from, uh, North York Arts, Scarborough Arts, and Urban Arts. The local arts service organizations are community arts organizations which have a shared mission to provide free, accessible, and quality programming to the communities we serve every day. And we thank you for acknowledging the importance of arts and culture by including funds in the 2023 budget, which are in line with 2022 figures. As you may know, the arts are a cornerstone in building a healthy, connected, and inspired city. The arts improve health, mental health, and well being. They alleviate social isolation. They inspire us to live better lives and to create jobs that contribute to a growing economy. But we want to talk about arts outside of the downtown core as local art service organizations. We all deserve access to the arts. The lassos combined continue to advocate on behalf of communities that need it the most. It used to be the case that you had to go downtown to see a play or join an art course or get an arts job. But we stand firm in our belief that times have changed and communities outside of the downtown core deserve fair and equitable access to participation in and of the creation of art at home and in their own communities. So what exactly does access to community arts mean? And to us as six local art service organizations, it means continuing to provide free and accessible arts programs uh, and activities to all ages close to home. Uh, it also means bringing free events, festivals, artworks like murals and sculptures into local community spaces. It provides jobs, entrepreneurship and learning opportunities for artists living in the community for whom downtown may have become too expensive and inaccessible. As a professional artist myself, I see many artists who've had to move outside of the downtown core in order to continue their practice. Now, in spite of our disproportionately limited resources, the lassos together deliver on these objectives year round. You can read it in our impact reports and within our communities. And we do have four asks with respect to the 2023 budget. And we understand that you are faced with many constraints that are, are a result of the financial pressures from COVID-19. That said, we do have four asks as local arts service organizations. One, together with our peers at the Toronto Arts Council, which did deliver a deputation yesterday, we ask the council to commit to working with this sector to develop new responsive cultural plans with, with clear targets and measures to enhance the arts sector. And second, we ask that the local arts service organizations play an integral role in the development of these culture plans to ensure that all Toronto neighborhoods are considered and not just the downtown core. Thirdly, we ask the budget committee to commit to increasing the arts budget in the future years and to, and to prioritize lassos while doing this. This would be a step in the direction of bringing the per capita investment in communities outside of the downtown core in line with um, other art service organizations. The cities, in short, the city's arts funding pie needs to get bigger over the years and not reshuffled or reallocated to accommodate the growing needs and the populations of communities outside the downtown core. And finally, we ask that the current arts funding is stabilized, is sustained, and, and is not at risk of cuts in the future in order to deliver on the city's priority of economic recovery. Remember, going back to those um, investments that arts and culture make in terms of the well being of our community. The lassos need consistent and reliable support from the city today and in the future. 
So we thank the city for its support of arts outside of the downtown core over the past several years, in particular in 2022. But we do ask that this support continues in 2023 and beyond. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Questions? Oh, Councillor Bravo. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I heard Toronto Arts Council yesterday uh, and was able to ask a couple of questions. It's clear that um, arts organizations uh, and artists uh, make a huge disproportionate contribution to the uh, GDP and to the economy of Toronto, um, and that not only are artists leaving downtown, so many are leaving Toronto altogether, so appreciate the focus on um, the livability of the, um, the artists themselves. What I, what I wanted to ask you about was the dimensions of community safety. Um, community arts, as I understand it, uh, plays a really crucial role in convening um, young people to reflect on their identity, um, to work through their challenges, sometimes traumas, in a really productive way and have had an enormous, enormous result and, and have, have been extensively studied, so there's lots of evidence around from all over the world around this, to uh, preventing youth uh, violence and crime. Can you comment a little bit about what your contribution is um, and what, how that might benefit, especially the, the communities in the outside, outside of the old city of Toronto? Absolutely, and I can certainly comment on behalf of Lakeshore Arts, the uh, local art service organization that I'm representing. We do offer, right now our programming is very heavily focused on youth, uh, specifically to LGBTQ youth, and we also have uh, a collective of youth that is very focused on arts uh, and climate activism. But these programs have del delivered just uh, innumerable results in terms of giving our youth something to become a part of bigger than themselves in our community and also to uh, connect with others who are like minded and share identity with them and also allows them an opportunity to contribute to social projects that enhance community and overall community well being. And so I've seen in my short time as I've joined. Uh, this year in uh, August as the new executive director of Lakeshore Arts, the programs that we've delivered in allowing youth to participate as well-meaning and also intentional members of our community and our community of South Etobicoke. And so giving youth opportunities to learn new skills and meet other individuals who are like them, either in an in-person environment or online virtually, any way that's accessible, it allows them opportunities to be exposed to programming and skills and development that they otherwise would not have access to uh, for other social reasons outside of their communities. And so I've seen it happen within South Etobicoke uh, as you know, delivering programs to youth that are having direct impacts and, and delivering programs and products and digital assets to our community. We recently ran a radio program with Toronto Metropolitan University and our Youth Climate Collective was able to deliver an entire radio program sharing presentations and research that they've done themselves on their own individual climate action and urging the community to participate in climate action. So that's something that's delivering directly into our community to support community efforts in terms of climate action and other aspects of activism. So that's just an example I can share from my experience in terms of how um, you know, arts and culture delivery really supports uh, social involvement and the security of our youth and the next generations to come. Thank you. And uh, another, I just wanted to check on something I also asked yesterday as well to Toronto Arts Council. I understand that this budget actually doesn't create, uh, give you a, an inflationary or cost of living increase um, to the to the Toronto Arts Council. But in response to a question about whether um, TAC would be able to distribute funding for uh, violence prevention um, and, and gang diversion, for example, or programming that actually helps people find a better path forward? Um, the answer was yes, and I, would, the, would organizations like yours be able to be part of the solution like that? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, given um, you know, my, my local art service organization has experienced violence within its neighborhood, you know, across the street. And, you know, being a new leader in this neighborhood, I would love to see us uh, contribute to that effort as well, um, delivering drop-in programs or, uh, you know, uh, opportunities that divert 
um, attention away from you know negative paths that our youth can tend to fall on due to social uh, constructions in our, our community. So I, I believe that a combined effort between TAC and, and local art service organizations would be a great addition to um, circumventing um, the, the issues that are facing our youth today. Thank you. Thank you. Our Thank next you. deputant is uh, Rafael Arujo. Rafael? Are you okay? Hello? Go. I'm just starting my video here. Hopefully that'll work. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, you have five minutes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, my name is Rafael Arujo. I use they, them pronouns. I live in Etobicoke in the York Southwestern riding. Uh, I was born and raised in this riding. I've lived my entire 29 years of life here in Toronto. Um, I love this city and I'm very privileged to live here. I am speaking to you today to express my concern about the 2023 city budget, particularly the cuts to shelter hotels and 24 seven respite centers, as well as cuts to uh, public health services and cuts to public transit. I would like to share a brief story of a kind young man I met named Daryl this past summer, um, who was unhoused at the time. Uh, when I met Daryl on uh, in Bloor West Village, actually, where I normally do my shopping, I noticed him immediately because one side of his jaw was very swollen. I stopped to talk to him um, and he was very kind and personable gentleman and he told me that he had an abscess, which is why his jaw was swollen. He had been prescribed antibiotics, but he said that he had no food to take them with. I spent a few hours with him that day. We shared a cigarette and talked. I, I learned a little bit about his life and I bought him some basic necessities, including food uh, for him to take with him. I remember that his biggest request was a portable radio so that he could listen to music at the encampment where he was living at the time. This was this past August that I met Daryl. We are now in the depths of winter. I think of Daryl every day and I wonder if he is still alive. I find it horrifying that the city is cutting the shelter hotel program and 24 seven respite centers in the dead of winter in January. I think of Daryl perishing on the street because shelters are overcrowded and turning away people every day and now there will be no shelter hotels where he can go either. Combine that with proposed cuts to public transit, as well as a 10 year plus wait list for affordable housing at this time. And I just don't understand how unhoused folks like Daryl are supposed to survive in this city. Instead of increasing affordable housing, which is now at a level of crisis in this city due to the sky high and increasing cost of housing, Opening 24, instead of opening 24 seven respite centers due to extreme cold and heat and expanding shelter hotels, the city has instead proposed to cut funding to these essential services and leave our unhoused neighbors to perish essentially. Instead of funding these vital programs, the city has decided to put $50 million towards the police budget. What does that mean for people like Daryl? It means that he will have nowhere to get warm, nowhere to seek shelter, no access to services that he requires to live, such as shelter and medical needs. And he will instead have more police around to tear down any encampment that he creates to try to survive and to kick him off of parks and city streets, even though he has nowhere to go. I sincerely ask city council to divert the proposed $50 million increase to police services to instead divert them to public services, including 24 seven respite centers, expanding the shelter hotel program, which is an excellent stopgap me stop gap measure that reduces COVID transmission between our unhoused neighbors and provides them with some privacy and dignity as well as shelter. Uh, I also request uh, the committee to invest in affordable public housing immediately. It's really a crisis, even for those of us who managed to remain housed as well as funding public transit and keeping fares low and affordable for everyone. And additionally, funding mental health programs. Daryl, a wonderful person that he is, has issues with alcoholism and a severe 
trauma history, which no doubt has contributed to the situation that he has found himself in. And there are no real services for him to access for that either. We do not need more police. Police will not provide housing, health care, or public safety. Only robust investment in public health services will provide our community with the safety that we are seeking. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay, thank you very much for your deputation. Our next deputant is Angela Stigliano. Angela, are you on the line? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Angela, you have five minutes. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Angela Stigliano. I've listened to many of the speakers today and yesterday raising their concerns to this subcommittee. Speaker after speaker eloquently raised the most urgent issues affecting our city, including that police, to which this budget proposes to increase funding by nearly $50 million, disproportionately cause harm to citizens already marginalized and made vulnerable by other policy choices. Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities our unhoused neighbors and people in mental health crisis are regularly brutalized and put in danger, even killed by police actions. These speakers have addressed this issue at length, and I can only echo their concerns. There is no more important reason to defund the police than the harm that they cause to these communities in schools, on transit, at universities, as we are seeing in headlines recently, and in our streets and parks. You have been told this over and over again, year after year. The Toronto Police Service themselves admitted to the disproportionate harm they caused to racialized communities last summer. Yet somehow these facts, the knowledge of the harm that police cause, that City Council causes by continuing to rubber stamp their budget requests and look the other way and pretend that city leadership is not responsible when the harm continues, somehow has not been enough to inspire City Council to make a different choice. Your response, and in particular Councillor Crawford's response to yesterday's speakers has somehow been we hear you and we don't care. What I can add is that this is not an issue that you or anyone should look at and think that doesn't affect me. I'm white, I own a house and a car, I live in a good neighborhood. No one should think that. Police do not make this city safer. Funding police does not make any of us safer. Community makes us safer and police fracture communities. This budget as it is proposed fractures communities. Is this really the choice that this subcommittee, that this city council is willing to make? Every dollar of the already more than one billion that is spent on police in this city is taken directly away from shelters and warming centers, from safe injection sites and programs that address food insecurity. Yes, and those dollars will do far more there to make Toronto safer than they will in a police budget. But these are also dollars that are taken away from arts programming, from education, from libraries, from lifeguards at pools in the summers, from camps and after school activities during the year. These are funds removed from affordable housing and from the TTC, from public transit during a climate crisis. These are dollars that are stripped from recreation services for the elderly, from health care and mental health care for all of us. They're pulled from the better and safer infrastructure, not just for cars, but for pedestrians and cyclists. They are taken away from parks and from public washrooms that would benefit everyone in this city. All of these programs do far more to keep us safe than police do. You tell us that defunding the police is a radical idea, but somehow it is perfectly acceptable for you to defund the arts, children, the TTC. Funding the police amounts to defunding the entire rest of the city. The police budget is already over $1, million, $1 billion. Perhaps if we need more 911 responders, the officers who are destroying tents and ticketing cyclists could be diverted. I demand that City Council reject the proposed budget increase for the police and also to find a shred of morality and backbone and take a step further to defund the already bloated police budget and instead to fund the services that actually support the people of this city and actually make our city safer. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you very much. Our next deputant is Hanya Cheng. Hey, Hanya, you have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Tory, Councillors, and Committee Chair. Thanks for listening to the public's feedback about the city's budget this week and for the opportunity to speak. 
My name is Hanya Chang. I am a queer, non-binary cultural worker and artist born, raised, and currently living in Ward 9 at Ossington and DuPont. In 2019, I was recognized by the city's Pam McConnell Youth Leadership Award for my work in youth-led grassroots community arts organizing within Chinatown. This is my first time deputating because I'm deeply concerned about this year's problematic budget proposal. Yesterday, I cried multiple times listening to the deputants share at City Hall about how policing doesn't keep their community safe or address the root causes of violence, how social services are being cut and stretched too thin. So I'm here to ask this subcommittee, how many more people will die at the hands of this budget? On January 13th, during the budget committee review, Chris Moyes asked the TPS to confirm that, the, that Toronto spends more money per capita than other major cities on their police force. I watched as the TPS lie through their teeth in response by saying that the TPS continues to take a declining share of the city's budget. This declining share continues to be the biggest line in the budget year after year at a staggering $1.1 billion, which was 7.4% of the city's total operating budget in 2022. This current budget speaks volumes about what the city's priorities actually are. This budget is a performance of safety, inclusivity, and equity. As a musician, performing is my job. As elected civic leaders and public servants, performing is not your job. Your job is to invest in community-driven, harm reduction, evidence and data-based proven strategies that genuinely put the most vulnerable people first. This year, there's a proposed $48.3 million increase to the TPS, and it just doesn't make sense, especially while the city claims there's no money for shelters, safe injection sites, drop-in programs, 24-7 warming centers and respites, while so many frontline social services and supports aren't even getting an increase to meet inflation. This budget isn't adding up. 200 more police officers for the TPS, while the city stalls to fully expand and fund the incredibly successful non-police crisis response pilot. This pilot proves that 911 calls should and need to be triaged, and that a majority of 911 calls do not need someone with a license to kill showing up. Two million for encampment evictions, while the multi-unit residential acquisition MURA program is underfunded. 20 more fare inspectors while there's decreased services and increased fares. By now, I hope the calls for defunding the police and funding social supports instead have been heard loud and clear. Policing has been proven as a discriminatory practice of violence against unhoused, poor, disabled, queer, trans, black, and indigenous people. If you want safer communities, invest in people, not punishments. I urge the mayor to commit to crime prevention by truly investing in decommodified housing, food security, mental health services, free transit, robust public libraries, education systems, and recreational programs to name a few. I love this place and I'm deputating, I'm deputing because I believe that Toronto can resourcefully and creatively respond to the housing crisis with care instead of austerity and over-policing. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Next deputant is Mary Malkovic. Mary? Okay, Mary, you have five minutes. Okay, you can hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's been great hearing from my fellow citizens. I want to start by saying that um, supporting our most vulnerable citizens is a priority. Our, our seniors, those struggling with mental health issues and all and other vulnerable people, there, there's a lot going on in our city and there's a lot of help that needs to happen. Um, having said that, I also believe in fiscal responsibility. The reality is, is that we only have a finite amount of money in tax dollars and Toronto is in a state of deficit. What this means is like many citizens, we need to look at the efficiencies, spending where we get the greatest benefit and redirecting less impactful tax dollars to where they benefit our community the most. Um, 
The current level of spending is not sustainable and dollars alone will not solve our issues. Throwing money at problems is never the only issue. Um, we need to look at more efficient ways of, of leveraging those dollars to deliver the best services for our citizens. Um, families, as you know, and as we've heard from, from my, our fellow citizens today, are struggling to meet, to meet expenses, to, meet their, to, make, to pay their bills. So we really, really need to do more with our money. And, um, and I'm expecting, and I, I don't have all the answers, but I'm expecting that our, our great council here will come up with some good ideas to, and creative ideas to, to, to stretch our dollars further. And, and I think that's what a lot of us are expecting. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, question. Mary, uh, thank you for speaking to us. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, I can. Um, I take your point very well as someone that served on the city's audit committee for a number of years, uh, that there are ways to do things better. Um, a previous speaker did criticize looking at fare evasion. And I remember that the audit committee considered a report on that. Would you be supportive of such a measure? Um, you know, looking at the business that we operate, um, doing it a little differently, and if it's understood that that is a, a potential place where there is a, a lot of money involved, is that something that you would support? Uh, I, I think I, I missed the person who had spoken about fair evasion. I don't, I don't know what the context is exactly, so it's difficult for me to comment on that. I, I think um, it, to, to characterize, I, I'm going to highly paraphrase, but I just, I think there was some criticism sure. about investing in enforcement on fair evasion. And I just wondered if oh, okay. you had an opinion here or there. So, you, in other words, you have to um, spend a bit more in order to look at that element to decrease fare evasion. Is that something that's okay? You know, so I, I'd have to look a little bit more into it, to okay. be honest. I don't have a, a deep, but however, um, you have to also look at how much is that? Like, it, it just at a, on a surface level, I mean, how much money? How much? How much money is being evaded? How much money is are we really losing? So I, I, I think that mean, needs a more educated. I need. I would need to look at the materials and and have a more informed decision, uh, informed perspective before I could comment on that. So that's a fair, um, I think, question. But I, I, I don't have the background. Fair enough. Um, and just in terms of services, I, I do wholeheartedly take the point about looking at saving money by doing things more efficiently. But at some point, the city does grow, right? There are more people, mm -hmm. there are more homes. And so investing in uh, paramedics, fire services, and police could be prudent. And I wondered if you uh felt the same way. Of course. And when I do say about looking at efficiencies, I mean, I, I would, I think citizens as a whole would like a more, a better look at how our monies are actually being spent in, in terms of line by line almost, because I think um, there are certainly efficiencies. When you look at your household budget, for example, there are places that, you know, are nice to have rather than real um, need. We need the, we need, we need the spending to happen. So, um, of course, you know, having services available to citizens, you know, that are life saving is, is a priority. Um, but you have to look at it, the way I would look at it is the whole big picture, you know, prioritizing in terms of what is the highest need and where, where these monies would best impact um, and give us best um, results. So, okay. You know. uh, last question, just on that vein, are there things that, uh, examples for the committee that, you know, in your opinion as a citizen, you think are the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves. So that when we go through the budget documents, we, you know, we keep among many opinions we heard today, yours as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly, I think um, 
safety is a priority. I think there's no answer. I mean, it's not cut and dry. It's not, it, 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 there can't, we need, in my opinion, and this is only my opinion, we need police services. I agree with many of the speakers from both perspectives. I think, I'm sure there's efficiencies in terms of where our, where our um, police are most beneficial, like the community, um, Constable, that sounds like a wonderful program. It sounds like it's been very impactful in a, and the community has has thrived and it's benefited the com community. I'm sure there's places when you look, it's like where, you know, where, where can we use our law enforcement to be part of the community and to bring the most benefit? So, you know, it, 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 it really is a case by case situation and looking at what where, where we're seeing the most value and where we're seeing the most returns. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Just, uh, Appreciate it. I, I, do, I do have the answer um, for um, the TTC on the honor system. We've lost $60 million. Yeah. $60 million. Six zero million dollars. <laughs> yeah, I just, because I asked that question at budget last week. That's why I know. Okay, thank you. It's, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you. That's a lot of money. Um, yeah, I agree. Okay, our next deputant is Ross Hen Hazrani. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Rajin Nasrani. Um, I live in Ward 3. Um, in the Mimico area, and I'm also the president of the Mimico Residents Association. And as part of this process, we did ask our members to share with us what their priorities are and how, uh, insofar as they relate to this budget. And I've uh, summarized the most important issues that we've heard from the community here in Mimico and wanted to share that with this committee today. In terms of the top priorities for some common themes, uh, again, pertaining specifically to, to Mimico, um, the first one being uh, numerous large scale condo developments in the area. Um, Mimico is a rapidly growing community and our members care deeply about preserving the, a high quality of life in this neighborhood. While we recognize that more development is is needed there is concern from the community that um the the sheer number and scale of these developments are out of sync with the community's current capacity in terms of roads transit amenities and infrastructure and and furthermore there's concern about the city's ability to invest in 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 these community assets in line with the growth uh, that this area is experiencing um, secondly, there's the issue of rising traffic congestion and poor road safety and the related lack of investment in expanding transit options into the city, um, especially public transit and cycle lanes. And lastly, um, affordable housing, which we're finding is often not prioritized among the many housing developments in the area, which tend to focus on luxury condominiums, um, and smaller, like one bed condos, uh, and, and specifically units tailored for investor appetite. Um, from what I've seen in this budget, uh, we don't feel that it adequately invests in the community assets and infrastructure that our community needs. Uh, it's also concerning that important capital projects, including building tens of thousands of new housing units and other important transit and climate action projects might be put on hold if revenue shortfalls aren't addressed by other levels of government. And my, from my understanding, um, uh, there, there hasn't been any firm assurances or guarantees um, or from the province or the federal government that they will make up those revenue shortfalls. And it does raise the question as to why the city wouldn't pursue other revenue tools to address Toronto short, uh, Toronto's shortfalls, including, yes, um, things like commercial levies. I heard Councillor Holliday earlier interrogate another speaker about um, uh, Sherway Gardens as an example. Um, this is a this is real estate that's owned by Cadillac Fairview, a multinational, multi-billion-dollar real estate conglomerate. 
Um, and yes, this is this is an entity that um, can afford to pay a little bit more versus putting the burden on working Canadians who are already being squeezed, as we know. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about traffic um, and, and transportation in this area. Um, we're finding more and more that traffic congestion in Mimico and the Humber Bay area is a, is a huge and growing problem as we're kind of the um, gateway to the city's west end. And to uh, address uh, these issues, as well as climate change goals and equity goals, um, we feel that more investment is needed and, and it's, it's currently lacking in public transit and cycling. For example, we've recently lost the uh, Lakeshore Streetcar Service um, uh, uh, due to the need for repairs and bus service outside of rush hour is infrequent in this area. Um, and, 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 and the current budget, which aims to increase TTC fares while cutting service and doesn't prioritize investment in expanding our cycling network um, is, is concerning to us. Um, lastly, I'll speak briefly about crime. Uh, this is something we do hear from the community, that crime is an issue. We haven't heard much about the need for increased enforcement. I, I don't believe that the residents in our community believe that this is the best way to combat crime and ensure community safety. So, um, uh, so the budget increase for Toronto Police, we uh, do agree with other speakers that can, can um, you please, it potentially is misdirected. Can you please wrap, wrap it up? Okay, thank you. Councillor Holliday. I'm done. Thank you for speaking to us. I was intrigued by some of your trailing comments, and that was that crime was of concern to the community. And I, I believe that, because as a, as a councillor, I hear that too. If the residents, as you stated, don't support more resources, what do they think is the answer? So what we're hearing from the community is not necessarily solutions, but a desire um, for officials to address the root causes of our uh, of crime and community safety issues versus just the downstream impacts, um, and 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 certainly enforcement and policing would be in the latter category. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So um, we have one more deputant, but I do need a motion. Um, that uh, we extend um, to hear the last deputant because it's 4.30. Mm -hmm. I'm moved by Councillor Crisanti, second by Councillor Bravo. All in favor, carried. Our last deputant is Star Smith. You have five minutes. Thank you, I'll talk fast. The following comments are in plain language, hopefully so that everyone may understand. In my opinion, this is not a budget. Uh, council must by law complete a balanced budget, meaning without any shortfall. This, is, this offering is not that. It contains too many ifs and not enough solid information on where the funds will come from. If I am correct, the province is taking away some 80 million in development fees alone through Bill 23, give or take, which we use to pay for everything from roads to sewers to parks and more. A note in the fine print says we hope the very province who removed our ability to raise this money will have an epiphany and realize the error of their ways and give us the same money back through other channels. This is not logical when MPPs across the province are still repeating the same story. Last week, an MPP told us that the city has a secret slush fund so we can actually afford to give up that money. Our chief planner says that is not so, that the money the province thinks it found is already allocated to pay for work underway. Should we use our emergency fund? If it's there in case of emergencies, so I don't think that's viable. So Toronto must find new money to pay for upkeep for our city and raise more to cover inflation when even current projects will cost more. Our mayor is a champion of his strong mayor powers, so I suggest the responsibility is his to get the answers from the province 
uh, who are trying to take his place by controlling us before anyone votes on any budget. The largest increase is the addition made to the police. I'm in favor. It was not long ago council voted to toe the line on police budgets. The results was that our experienced officers fled the Toronto police services in droves. When the beleaguered chief at the time was trying to deliver the same service with less money, he promised to graduate 200 new officers, I think it was. No one raised a voice to point out that new graduates can't replace seasoned officers. The value of a new officer is maybe one to three. It takes years of experience to become a good officer. Sadly, some never make it. I remember that virtually overnight, Topico Lakeshore became a less safe place to live. Our subdivision was closed, turned into a property office. Drug dealers flourished with the same speed. So I agree that we need more officers on the street, but where is the money for neighborhood supports for youth, especially mar marginalized kids? Last fall, I called to find out how these programs were working. I asked about community policing or coffee with a cop, names used in the past. I started with my own division. I was passed to other divisions. I finally called police headquarters. Again, I was passed from one department to another. None of them knew what I was talking about. At that point, I knew why nothing was changing in police dealings with difficult cases. Toronto Police Services know nothing about communication. Letting everyone know what you were doing is the first step in any successful program. So if we are expecting to get something new in the way of community policing to prevent crime and to support new generations coming up from the chief on down, there must be excitement created about this new kind of policing and a separate budget. The young recruits in police college is where to start talking about the plan in conjunction with disadvantaged groups. The budget only states <clears throat> new officers will be hired. Study after study say the same thing, that only community support for the young will make a difference. What it, where, where is that funding? Is it in the social services budget? If so, that's not good enough. If the police want to control their own house, then they must play nice and collaborate with other groups who understand the mental health aspects. In late fall, through a colleague in one of my community groups, I received a copy of an invitation to first a family day and then coffee with a cop. The family day offered TTC tickets as well as free food because in my neighborhood, often parents can't, uh, don't go because they can't afford the fare and they can't let their kids go alone, they're too young. A couple of charming officers came in a matter of hours with the flyers, but free TC, the free TTC offer, offer was gone. I was told the other, the offer was only for TCHC residents in New Toronto. And so the flyers were never posted. Better for residents not to know than the children to be disappointed again. Again, they don't understand communication. This is another, there is another illustration that the police need help in communication with uh, matters. Coffee with the cop was very informative. I found out why so can, few can officers- Can you wrap it up, please? It's over five minutes. So few officers know about it. It's called chain of command. I didn't get to my primary um, interest, which is uh, tenants and thank, what's thank going on with tenants. I will, I will post this so you can read the last couple of paragraphs. Yes, thank you for that. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, you mentioned that you had contacted a number of people in the police with an interest in understanding the communications process. Did any of them ever mention the Community Police Liaison Committee, the CPLC? No, they didn't know about it. Uh, I now have my own neighborhood policeman. Your 22 division? 22. You are 22. Um, would, it, would it be helpful, <laughs> we have to ask questions, but rhetorically, would it be helpful if we got in touch and I could refer you to the CPLC? And I, I raise this out of reverence to the many community volunteers that work on that committee. They do hard work. Uh, towards many of the things that you just spoke about, I just feel bad that someone didn't mention it. If you want to well, reach no, out... The, that's not the issue. Okay. The issue is there's a systemic problem here. And part of it is control, as I see it. 
And we, I looked through the budget, you know, as much as I could line by as many lines as I can see now. And it indicates that probably the new programs are under social services and that the police budget is under police. Yes. I think that's the problem because okay. if they don't talk to each other, there's never going to be. And, you know, they've got the communications again. Why does this fly love me? The <laughs> communications again are about um, the fact that um, they need to be able to get rid of this chain of command idea where that doesn't mean, I mean, sure there's an, a system and method for going up the chain. I spent, by the way, most of my life around police. So it's, I understand some of the nuance. But you've got to be able to talk to the other guys or you're never going to make anything happen. Okay, thank you. And we have the communication, that's, I'm sorry, just one last thing. Yeah, no, go ahead. The communication was because, um, like, yes, what was it this morning or yesterday? They announced the new, um, uh, that they've $87 million in drugs and X number of millions in cash and guns and everything. We've got to collect, we've got to convince people that the two are connected. You know, you can't just take away the police, they're our first responders. Right? To re redo that system would be a, a hell of a problem. So what we need is for the police to agree and talk to the people in the social services. As far as I can see, that's where that money is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. One last question, Councillor Grisanti. Just quickly, you mentioned that uh, you didn't get a chance to tell us about what's going on with tenants. Oh, yeah, one paragraph. <laughs> can, can you just quickly, uh, you know, do that so we know? Okay. Just a sec, it's over here. Um, another kick in the behind was the recent removal of all tenant protections. Under Bill, 22, under Bill 23, um, alongside removing protections for historic buildings in the green belt, is a line allowing developers to evict tenants permanently while they build their billion dollar towers. Neither will they have to help tenants find alternative housing as they do now or before Bill 23, while they are building and they do not have to keep room for them anymore in new buildings. Okay. Thank the you. result will, just a second, there will be a, a new class of homeless and there's nothing in our budget for that. We have to include, increase the homeless budget okay. specifically to take care of the people that Bill 23 is gonna throw on the thank street. You. Yes, thank, th you. thank you, thank you. Okay, can I have a, a motion uh, to uh, to receive the public deputations, Councillor? Hmm? Okay, it's on the screen. Moved by Councillor Crisanti. On favor? Carried. So we will now um, uh, adjourn the meeting. And we will convene uh, at 6 p.m. for our next session. And members, a reminder to log in the meeting using the WebEx details for the 6 p.m. meeting. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>